Today is January the 8th, 2017. We're interviewing Joshua Kaufman in Los Angeles, California. My name is Stephen Smith, and this interview will be conducted in English. So Joshua, thank you for agreeing to be interviewed by the USC Shoah Foundation. Uh, we're here with your daughter Judy, um, and we're really pleased that you were able to join us at the beginning of the interview, Judy. What does it mean to you, Joshua, to be sitting here today with your daughter at the beginning of your interview? What is my opinion? Yeah, how, it, how does it make you feel to be here with your daughter? I cannot express my feeling because I don't believe in the vocabulary exists an answer of this question because I don't, don't believe in nothing. I'm very sorry to explain to you even in don't believe in God. And I don't believe I am alive. I don't believe all the pictures what I see here is true but everything is documented. But to believe only who went through what I went through, who saw what I saw, who did with these two hands what I did, not somebody else. Not to get mixed up with the German fascist Gestapo, but I saw what they did. I say what I did with these two hands on the order of their command. And what does it mean to, ha to have your family with you today? I cannot find a word to express myself. Because like I told you, how can I believe that I can show my bank account? I was sure 100 percent that I had zero, zero, zero chance to survive. How I survived? Again, no answer. They call me a hero. I feel myself not a hero. After I was liberated, I was ashamed to say people that I'm a Holocaust survivor. Because in Israel, they call the Holocaust survivor Sabonim. Soap. Sabon. And I wasn't a Sabon, never. I was physically, mentally very strong. I wasn't a scary guy. But the education of my parents, beautiful people, and grandparents, and uncles, hundred people in my family, all of them with this pious, ultra-religious, everything said they from God. Judy, what does it mean to you to be here today? So, um, just a minute ago, my father referred to his bank account. And that is a portrait we did for him um, of the four girls, of us four girls. And my father gave us everything. So for us, we might be his bank account, but I mean, for him, we might be his bank account, but for us, he is our everything. Um, he gave us the best life you could ever imagine. It was like, it's a combination, if I can describe it as, any sort of book of inspiration like Siddhartha or The Alchemist or you watch these movies with these heroes in them and how do they do that and how do they survive and how are they so strong to this fascination of being in Disneyland every day. I mean every day felt like oh my god how do they do this? What is this? Everything that we experienced growing up was through his eyes of awe because I think for, for the most part, he, his life was cut off at a very um, crucial moment for any child. It's that, it's that cusp between childhood and, and teenagehood. And so everything he approached was through our eyes. So while he was raising children, he was also kind of going through his own experience of coming up in Los Angeles as this child. So not only was Universal Studios or Disneyland amazing, but going to the farmer's market and seeing all the fruits and vegetables was amazing. Or, you know, watching how certain people would wear high heels and cross a street was just amazing because every little thing was not taken for granted. Everything was seen with awe. And I think being raised with a father 
who was able to give that on to us, the sort of magic to everything is the greatest gift um, any child could ever wish for. And was the Holocaust very present in your home? So that's an interesting story. That's going to depend who you ask. Now, I'm the oldest, so I guess it's very pertinent that I'm the first one to be interviewed because I think I experienced the most. I think he wants to say something. This is him wanting to say something. I never ever said my children that I'm a Holocaust survivor. I'm going to say that. Okay. So here's what's interesting, though. So my father never told us that he was a survivor. He's right. You know that movie Life is Beautiful, where the survivor, it's an Italian actor, comedian, and he tries to pretend like everything's a game? He never told us he was a survivor. I picked up whisperings at a very early age, and I didn't know what they were, what they meant, but my, my dad and my mom and my grandma would whisper in Hungarian all the time, or sometimes in Hebrew, and I knew there was something different about us, for many reasons, but I couldn't really articulate that at a young age. When I was around, I think, you know, third or fourth grade and we started like, I guess, talking about the Holocaust or hearing about the Holocaust, um, I asked my father at one point um, if he was in the Holocaust. And I think he said, I mean, he always like, he always tried to make a joke about things, but I asked him, no, I'll tell you what happened. This is a great story. We came home one day and we were asked to do an assignment like where your parents went to school or college because we were going to report out, you know, in our front of our classroom. It was a really big thing. You had to stand up and talk about your parents and what they did for a living and blah, blah, blah. So I asked my father, where did you go? Where did you go to school? And he, I think as a joke, said I didn't go. I went to school in Auschwitz. So it was kind of like it was a, one of those ironic black humor moments. But as a child, I picked that up and I went back to my class and there we were in our really pretty little private Jewish school and everyone's going around, my daddy went to Harvard, my daddy's a doctor and he went to UCLA. You know, my mommy, my daddy, and they get to me and I go, my daddy went to Auschwitz. And at that point, the teacher just, you know, it was like a deadpan moment of silence. And I remember that. I remember my palm sweating and sharing that with the class and thinking, I don't know what I'm about to say, but I think this is different. So while I didn't know what it all meant, it was always there in whispers. Um, they did a great job keeping that from us growing up. Conversations started more when we were in high school. That's when I started to realize that my parents were Holocaust survivors. Why didn't you talk to your children about your experience, Joshua? Because uh, I loved them very much. And to tell children not this exactly the same thing is I'm acting like an actor and I'm not acting. To tell them the truth, I didn't have the, my power, my strength to tell my children that I'm a survivor. And if they ask me, how did you survive? One day they ask me, I told them, Listen, I cannot answer this question, but if you force me, I give you only one word. I became an animal. And they looked at me. My daddy, an animal. Can you give us an example? I said, no. He I didn't, cannot. it's true. He, he, so in high school at that time when he started talking about the Holocaust, he would only tell us a few sentences and they were the same sentences again and again and again and again. This went on for years and we were quite frustrated because we were 16, 17, 18. The topics in school became a lot deeper. The stories came out a lot more and we wanted to know and we would probe and probe. I, I remember sitting just like, you know, he has you at his table and likes to feed you. So I remember sitting during meals, Daddy, tell us, just tell us, tell us what happened, tell us the stories, where were you, where was mom, and a vault. And only later on when we were much, much older, I mean, I think he started talking more about it only when I was in my early 30s. That's how long it took for him to open up. On reflection, are you, now, now that you look back on that, do you feel that your parents, 
the right course of action? Would you advise them to? Have I think they saved our lives. I think they gave everything um, to make our home. It was a little bit, I mean, you might say it was a little bit like not Stepford Wives in the sense of like, you know, we didn't live very posh or elegant, but very kind of life is beautiful, everything's perfect. But again, going back to this point is almost like the opposite end of the spectrum to the horrif horrifying events that happened in their lives. They made our life magical. You know, you go on social media today and everyone's posting unicorns and hearts and little smiley emojis to try to capture this, you know, mystical, magical sense that everyone's amazing and unique. But they raised us that way. They raised us every day was literally a party in our house. Um, my mom was, was not well. She was sick. My mother was a, a baby, and so she was hidden during the war. And I think, I think because she couldn't, um, it, you know, she couldn't really express what happened to her during the Shoah in like a cognitive sense. It, it happened like somatically, so her body took on a lot of like these illnesses, and she was really challenged. And so my dad picked up the, the um, kind of towed the line for a mom and dad role. And he played both roles for us. So he was the nurturer, he was the storybook reader, he was the let's go on an adventure, he was the chef. And then eventually my mom also kind of was like that too, but he was our central parent. And if you ask, I think any of us, if what we remember, it was daddy picking us up from school, or daddy taking us to Disneyland, or daddy cooking that amazing meal. Um, and we, like I said, the biggest gift was having, instead of having a legacy of, I hear a lot of stories of children of survivors, it's very common that, um, you know, they take on a lot of the, um, and we have, I can get to that in another, in a whole other interview, but they don't, we don't have that sense of, like, woe is me, we don't have that um, sense of, there's not enough food, you know, or, or we're doing something wrong, or it, it was just all very, for the most part, positive. Um, you know, footnote, I do have my issues. Absolutely, I can absolutely say they are correlated to stuff that came up probably through post-traumatic stress disorder or second generation. But I don't have the, the, the common ones that you would hear uh, second generation having. What I did get out of it is he uh, conveyed a sense of, this was, this was the strongest message that my dad conveyed, was a sense of take care of yourself, be strong, be a survivor. So in a way, he raised four mini survivors. Growing up, he insisted that whatever a boy could do, raising four girls, we could do. So we had to learn how to swim, we had to learn how to bike ride, we had to learn how to roller skate, we had to learn how to drive stick shift when we got our license because it wasn't enough that we would just get into an automatic. What if you had to, you know, find yourself in a situation where you needed to drive off in an emergency and there was only a stick shift? So all these little kind of survivor tactics, like we were horseback riding, we were mountain climbing, we were doing everything at a very young age. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure part of the reason I joined the um, Israeli Defense Forces was because I was inspired by my father's journey. That as a Jewish person growing up in Los Angeles, I wasn't going to just drive a BMW and go to UCLA and that would be the end of my story. I needed to do something greater than myself. So it was kind of um, a big set of boots to fill. As you can see, he walks with his steel-toed boots. So I, I took on that very, um, you know, that, that kind of walk in, walk in his shoes as much as I can. Are you proud of your daughter? Some of the roads, they are my life. I raised them, not only I made them, to me it is the easiest thing, but to raise them. And I, am, I raised them orthodox schools. This was very expensive. Public school, I shouldn't spend the money, and I didn't have the money, because my wife is a real a religious woman, and I'm a real, not a religious person. I don't want to mention it again, but I want that my children go, grow up in ultra-religious, Zionistic upbringing. If they ate kosher, I don't care. If they ate Shabbat, I don't care. They later they can their own life.
today from the four daughters, college educated, two is Shomer Shabbat and two is not. But I love them the same thing. And I say it in all my speech. And I don't even know how I dare to go to a Jewish religious school and stand up on a stage, an uneducated person, never went not one elementary school, only I am the original student of Talmud for the famous ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionistic rabbi. His name is Rabbi Yoel Teitelbrunn from Satmar. And I myself had a bias like this, and I myself was ultra-religious to stand up in a Jewish religious school and announce it in front of the rabbis that I don't believe in God. You know, you take a big chance that they can take a broom and chase you down. Please, you are an atheist. So how you dare to come this speech? But I told them, I choose my God. My God is the American veterans who liberated us from Dachau. They are my God. And the Israeli soldiers who sacrificed their life for the state of Israel, Am Israel, Klal Israel, to the whole entire world. They are my God, period. But Daddy, tell them the story about your story with Yol Teitelbaum. Why don't you like the Satmar movement when your father went to him to get out of Hungary? He said, no. Tell them the whole story. The whole story is too short, but the whole story is a very long story. But I was already 13, 13 and a half years, and in my time was very unrespectful to ask questions from my father or from my grandfather. You had the right only to listen. Because if you ask questions, they call you a picoilers, a don't believer. And to tell them that I'm not a believer, I would hurt them the feeling because I was a believer. And when I started to ask my father, Daddy, we are well off people. We used to have 10, 15 people who worked for us Christian. And I asked my father, why we say every year Pesach, Shana, Bab, Shulai? We have money to buy a ticket and to go on a ship and to fly to Israel. They said, no, you cannot go to Israel until Messiah is not coming, Mashiach. The answer is beautiful. But I said to myself, something wrong. Who is Mashiach? I know who is the rabbi, Satmer. I know who is my parents. But who is Mashiach? He said, Mashiach will come, she bane Beit HaMikdash, when the Beit HaMikdash will be built up. Again, a beautiful answer. And later I ask another question. Daddy, why we cannot take a contractor? not uh, Donald Trump, because it didn't exist in this time, <laughs> to take any contract or to build the Beit HaMikdash. He said, no, Shere, you cannot build the Beit HaMikdash. The, build, the Beit HaMikdash is automatically built. When you make a mitzvah, a good deed, you put a brick of the Beit HaMikdash. And when Steve makes a sin, he takes down a brick. Again, a beautiful answer. But then again, talk to myself. Basically, they say Hungary, who is talking to himself, is crazy, but I positive wasn't crazy. But I couldn't say my answer. And I said, Daddy, the beta Megdos is yo-yo. This doesn't exist. One is putting up, one is taking down. When will, we, will the end Sheibane beta Megdos? And this was his answer. And I didn't take this answer. And what can I tell you? To raise by an ultra family like my, what I was raised, everything was God. We didn't have, we had horses, we had cows, we have a bicycle. And you can look at the bicycle, not to touch it. But, uh, but what happened with your old title bound? Which one your, gr your father went to him to ask him? He said it. not to go to well, Israel. What happened? He went to him? I went, I was, I went, usually I went with my father, but I was studying in his school, in his yeshiva. He said not to go to Palestine, the Geula, the liberation will come here. And did you see the liberation? No. 
but I went through it. And it's a very long story. Where but did I, this rabbi go? The rabbi went to Sveitsaria. <laughs> He's, with yeah, the Kastner. That story came up a lot growing up. The rabbi went to Sveitsaria with the Kastner transport who chose the lawyers, doctors, high level people to take them to Sveitsaria. And I arrived there, you see this place, Saturday morning, six o'clock. Auschwitz. Auschwitz. But that story came up a lot when we were little. Why did you join the IDF? It was, I was very inspired by, by my father, his stories growing up. So his stories growing up were about Israel. So that is what we knew all the time, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We were taught songs, uh, Zionistic songs. We were told stories, these incredible fun stories about life in Israel as a pioneer. Um, the roads that he helped build, the wars that he fought in. It, it, it was told in a really loving way. He also told great stories about how he was friends with Bedouin and how he lived with the Arabs and how back in that time it wasn't this, it wasn't as politically charged as it is today. It was a much more beautiful time. And so a sort of romanticized version about what it meant to be in the army and how much fun it was. And to tell you the truth, it was really a lot of fun to be in the army. Um, I had a great time. Which but unit were you in? I was in the Air Force. Um, I was a technical English teacher at um, an Air Force base in the south of Israel, a pretty famous one, and um, I loved it. I loved basic training. So I was in basic training and all the girls would be crying, you know, typical. They, they were just, I would just watch, they would like cry. We had to take these group showers and you're running and you're making your bed and you're being yelled at. I thought it was just really fun. I thought, I felt like I was in a private Benjamin or something and I thought, for God's sakes, we're not in Auschwitz. Like literally that was what would go through my mind. I mean, as a child of a survivor, I was like, we're safe, we're in Israel. No one's really gonna hurt us. We might have some bruises and cuts after basic training. We might not have slept and we might be eating really nasty food, but we're gonna be safe. Um, so I loved it. And I was definitely inspired by my father's stories of Israel and um, just doing something greater than yourself. And my dream was that all my children go to the army. And for two reasons, I'm a little bit selfish. I was sure that from all of these good looking pilots <laughs> in Israel, and she is not an ugly child. Nobody can say that she is not beautiful. I was thinking with one pilot, she will marry, she will fly over with an F-15 above my home that I married this pilot, and this is my a husband. A lot of fantasies, so this was but also growing up. <laughs> but she never, she never married a pilot. But I, I was don't friends care. with a lot of pilots. I don't care. I brought a lot of pilots um, home who you got to meet and who were friends with, and actually... I don't look back. I'm actually, happy. I will say this. Um, you know, I married an artist. I didn't marry a, a, a military man. Um, but I, I will say this. Um, it was definitely after I went to the army that he started to open up a little more. And I brought home a lot of friends who were very high-ranking officials in the Israeli government and in the army. I worked for the Israeli consulate for several years here in Los Angeles. And it was that time meeting these people that he, somehow meeting them and seeing that his children were, were traveling in these circles of people who were very... Um, kind of the, the um, strong, powerful Israeli Jews that were around, it opened up conversations that, um, of his past. He shared with them a lot. You mentioned, final question, you mentioned that there were some consequences for you. Can you share those with oh, us? Gosh, you have to go there. <laughs> um, yeah, I... Um, I definitely, definitely think that a lot of the, um, a lot of the, he doesn't like, he doesn't like when I talk about this, but I spent many years in therapy. I became a therapist. I, I became an art therapist and a psychodrama um, facilitator. I don't practice. I don't have a license because it was, I studied in Israel. It was sort of like a master's degree. And I did it for myself for healing, a lot of healing. Um, I think that 
there is a sense of, um, on the positive, that there's a sense of kind of urgency to live life to the fullest. So I, I'm, I'm an adventurer. I lived in India. I trekked in the Himalayas in Nepal. I scuba dive. I horseback ride. So in the positive, that is definitely how it influenced me. I love to learn. Um, I love to meet new people. Um, and that's been really great, uh, my sense of community, et cetera. Um, in the negative side, um, I was very angry. I was very angry when I was a little girl, like from a very, very young age. Um, and I, I, it, I spent years working through what that anger was because here I had this like literally most amazing childhood any child could ever dream of. In fact, we had many friends who were very, very, very affluent and they, you know, the parents would drive Bentleys and Jaguars and Rolls Royces and would all come and sleep in our one bedroom apartment because they didn't want to be at their own houses because our house was warm and fun and, and, and just an adventure. Um, and so why would I be angry? I had nothing to be angry about. But I think there was some sort of anger or not knowing, like a journey that I had to go through to figure out you know, who I really was and where I really came from and what my story was. And, and, um, and I had a lot of that anger about what, at one point during my teenage years, there was an anger of what was done to us as Jewish people. I, that was probably what spurred going to the army, that whole never again. Um, in fact, I wanted to tattoo never again um, in the spot where my dad would have had a number. He didn't have a number because he was taken in 44, the Hungarians. A lot of them were taken for the death uh, camps instead of the, um, the working labor camps. But I wanted a tattoo at one point, and I was really, I went through that whole stage of anger. Um, Definitely like that, that second generation PTSD. It, it was a subject that came up a lot. Um, how did it manifest beyond the anger? Um, probably a little recklessness, you know. Um, just testing boundaries. Um, and um, today I'm in a much different place. I've made peace with a lot of that stuff. I've been through journeys and learned and, and and experienced and grown a lot. And so now I can say that um, for the most part, really positive. Um, I also, interestingly enough, um, the person I chose to marry, I think, influenced that in a very subconscious way because this is gonna sound absolutely crazy. And while I have dated many wonderful Jewish men, I, uh, for the most part, also dated a lot of non-Jewish men and I preferred to be with someone who wasn't Jewish. I think subconsciously having my last name, which I, by the way, haven't changed. I still go by Judy Kaufman because I've been that for too long. But I wanted my child to have this last name, Ledgley. And so that would make him like kind of nondescript. You know, he's, he's, he has an Anglo-Saxon last name and you know, his name is Ethan Ledgley. And um, I definitely think, and I remember as a child, this would go through my mind. Subconsciously, I wanted my child to not be identified right off the bat as, oh, he's a Jew. Even though I raise him, like my dad says, he goes to Jewish Zionistic Orthodox schools and I, I educate him in a very traditional way. I loved my childhood. I'm not trying to get away from that. It was the heart of my, um, my joy and my, um, made me who I am. But I think something subconsciously drove me to be with someone who, who wasn't Jewish in a way that was like, no more of this kind of, even on the German side, no more of this puritanical, I'm a Jew, I'm a Christian, I'm black, I'm white. I just kind of like the idea of just being a person. So. If you had one thing to say to your father, what would it be? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you so much, and I hope you love me as much as I love you. We are obsessed with my father. So uh, slightly to a point where it's, probably not so normal. Um, he is our hero. He, you're my hero. I'm not a hero. Here we go. Okay, listen. <laughs> One thing, they say a saying, if you get burned once with something hot, the next time, even if you drink cold, <laughs> you blew it, maybe this, you will get burned again. 
I'm 100% uneducated, but I'm 101% intelligent. I can talk to Professor Stephen, I can talk to Obama, I can talk to everybody in the world, I know exactly what is going on. But I'm not involved in politics zero, in the American politics and the Israeli politics. I am only a survivor. And I have a lot of discussion with Rachel, because Rachel, from all That's my, my four children, she's really religious and she means the religious. And she's teaching religious and she's perfect in religious. It's not that I promoted her. And my point is, I'm a survivor. To give you an example, when I go in a movie, the first thing I look, where is the Where exist? are the exits? Yeah, where we do I that too. Where I can run away when a, mur a crazy guy, I don't care, terrorists, I don't care. Who. We do where that I too. can escape. This is like a dog, you know, you train him from surviving. Mm -hmm. This I look. Not when the problem is coming, where is the door? I have to check, this is the door, here I came in, there I have to go, that I check. And this I raise my children too. I told them a million times, somebody's coming and putting a gun and said, give me my purse, give him the key of the car and mm -hmm. tell him, be my brother or you don't touch me. But if somebody raising your hand on you, right back. you don't be a pisherke. You know what a pisherke is, that you make pee, -pee in the pants. You became a tiger. When you <laughs> became a tiger, you will survive. Otherwise, you are a pisherke. But if you want from you only the car, and tell him, be my brother. And once, for example, I went one day to a lake on Wilshire Boulevard. The children wanted to go, the dogs and the they said it's a very famous. And I went inside with four girls. And this park, this was the most dangerous park in this time in Los Angeles. Prostitute, drug addicted, gangster, and gangs and everything. It's a park in downtown. I and I went called. inside, I said, oh Joshua, where did you come with these four beautiful children to this place? I said, Joshua, you have to wait the time how you can go to rescue them from war. I took the worst looking guy, I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, listen, be my brother, take $10, show me how can I get out from here because I have a group of people I wanted to bring them in. And she said, come with me, you will go out. And he took me out and all the gangs that will look at me, but nobody dared to come to me because they saw him. And soon I went out, I disappeared, you know. All, the, all my life to survive. And all my problem is with my children, they criticize me <laughs> because I don't want to talk of the Jewish history of 3,500 years. I don't know that you don't have to know. You have to know everything. You have to be intelligent. You have to know where the Jewish people came, that we are not Palestinian from 100 years that discovered they are Palestinian and they want to live here. We are there for 5,000 years. And I don't want to teach this generation from 3,000 or 5,000 years or 2,000 years. I want to raise them and educate them for the next 100 years, because I'm 100 years old. No, don't laugh. I can talk to them until 100 years. My life, 100 years, who we survived today. And this is the point. And when I talk to the student 15 years, I have the strength to talk to them because they are my mirror. Because I wasn't born 100 years. I was once 12, 13 years. And I want to talk to them, not boobemises they see in Yiddish, but I ask for, excuse me, bullshit, 2,000 years, 3,000 years. They are very smart. They can talk to them. I want to talk to them how to survive this time. And this is my point. And my two children, the youngsters who are religious, they said, no, daddy, you cannot be anti-religious. Anti I said, I'm not anti-religious. History, I want to know the history of Hodu, India, 
America, everything is beautiful. But I want to teach them only of these hundred years how we were created and what we suffered all my life. You know what is to grow up in Hungary? I was beaten up every day or every week or every two weeks because I went on the street and they beat me up. And I didn't know what Jewish is. I didn't know what Jewish, I know Jewish, Jewish, Christian, Christian. But I, I saw you look like the same thing by me. And I asked him, why are you beating us up every day? What did I wrong? He said, you, you killed Jesus. I said, Jesus, Jesus was Jewish. And who cares what Jesus did 500 years ago? For this I have to beat them up, my father, my brother, as I want to teach them only how to survive in the last 100 years. And I pray only one prayer. You know what my word is to prayer? In Hebrew, they say, ye score, remember. Only this is my prayer. Before I go, if I could say one thing to my father, aside from I love you. I love you too. Love Thanks. is not an expression. <laughs> I, I love everybody. I kiss everybody. Everybody's he coming, does. hug me, I hug. But everybody's coming, kiss me, I kiss. I don't go to nobody. If they come, I would be crazy. I like women. I would be crazy to tell me, please don't hug me, don't kiss. She said, she, I went to the celebration, take the celebration with the generals, American soldiers, behind you. It's that picture over there with all the generals below Not this. it. Yeah, this. that one, yeah. One is a two-star general, one is a three-star general. I went to this, I was celebrated. You, you really know somebody there? No? I was put under your eyeglasses. Did you find? I was He's in the middle. I was there, but then I got the American flag and the American sword. And she told me, because I went before to another meeting, she told me, Daddy, you don't hug a woman, don't kiss a woman. I said, Eureka, I never went to know woman to hug and kiss. But did they come to me? And when I went to this meeting, she saw how they come to They all her. hugged and kissed him. All these four-star generals, women and men, it was kind of funny, he was right. And I gave them a speech. Can I say one thing before I go? You can go, you can sit. Okay, well I'm gonna go. But I'm gonna say one thing before I go. When you asked me to film today, I was just, you know what? I was like, I'm just gonna go with this. I have no makeup on. I did not do my hair. I had no idea we were gonna film. So I guess this is a very authentic experience for me. And that kind of confidence for being able to just sit in front of the camera and just do it comes from this man. The confidence, the awe of life, the, the, um, the charisma, that is all from him. And my one word to him, if I could say anything, would be thank you. Um, for giving us everything and my dad loves to say that the American soldiers and the Israeli soldiers are his God well I believe in God but he's my God on earth and um, we're just so grateful to him for everything um, everything for, again, for the good and and the, you know he says we fight with we do fight with him but he allows us to fight with him he likes a good debate I mean what kind of parent is able to engage in conversations that aren't, you know, totally from a place of authoritative, I am the last word. He likes to engage and have discussions and, and, and conversations, and he's just the best dad in the world, hands down. He has been a father to so many of our friends in Los Angeles and all over the world who kind of feel like they have a piece of him as, as their father. And so there was Mother Teresa, and there is Papa Joshua. And I get to live with him, and he's my dad. And I love you. See, you won't. <laughs>
Can you tell me when and where you were born? 1928, February the 20th. In this coming February, I'm 89 years old. But everybody asks me, how old are you, Joshua? I say I'm 90 years old. Because when I will become 90 years, I will promote myself that I'm an old man. And until 90, I was want to stay Joshua. Which city were you born in and what country was it? I was born in Hungary, the city named Debrecen. Let's say that I came to your home when you were a young child. What kind of home was it? Can you describe it to me? How was my childhood? The home that you lived in. We lived a beautiful life, but it was Hungary, they were more fascist than the Germans. They simply hated us because in the churches every Sunday they were talking about the hateness of the Jewish. And the Pope, the 12th, they called this in Hungary, Pius Papo, he was from the Vatican announcing all the time the hateness against the Jewish. And we were, I was a child, I didn't know, I really didn't understand what Jewish was Christian, I didn't know. I know that I'm a boy, I go to the yeshiva, not in school, but I didn't know who I am. I know this is my parents' religious, and I was all the time wondering why we have to live in such a danger. So to tell me about your home, to tell me about your father, what kind of man was he? Say it again. Tell me about your father. My, but my? Your father, what was his name? My father, he was, they were ultra, ultra fanatic religious. What was his name? Uh, his name was in Hungarian, Kaufman Shandor. But in a uh, regular name, he was Alexander. And this is a Yiddish name, Hebrew name, Yiddish Alexander. But it's not Yiddish, not Hebrew. But Kaufman Shandor is a Hungarian name. And but Yiddish, they called him Sender Alexander. And what kind of man was he? We had, um, he used to buy a forest in Czechoslovakia. He used to buy a whole forest and people used to cut out the trees because every tree is 20 feet or 30 feet high. And they used to send it from the lake to a place where was a, a rail station and they put it on the rail station, but the wood used to come down on the lake from the flowing of the water. And he used to take us all the time when he went to Czechoslovakia, Hungarian, and we used it, they called this ponton, because no cars could go there and no train rail was there. They put together the wood and the wood was floating 10, 20 kilometer to the place where it was a rail station. This was his profession. And we used to have 10, 15 people, Christian, working for us. And we had a very good relations with them. They were paid. They were not, every holiday was celebrated with parents. We were very nice to everybody. We didn't hate them. They hated us. Tell me about your mother. What was her name? My mother's name is, maiden's name was Moskowitz Berto. She was born in Czechoslovakia in a city, Hust, H-U-S-T. And when they married, my father didn't speak Czechoslovakian. And my language was at home, Yiddish. And was Yiddish your only language? This was Yiddish, and this was what we used in Hungarian. And how did you learn Hungarian? Hungarian, is ang you were born there. You automatically know your parents' language. 
even though they didn't speak, we were speaking at home only Yiddish, and sometimes Hungarian, but I still know Hungarian. What kind of home did you live in? What kind? Was it a house or an apartment? We were living in a very huge, with a lot like, uh, like a football field, with a oh, very huge lot and with a huge house on, on the lot, on the business where we had. It still exists a place. I went back with my children, and my children went to the city hall and asked back the properties what we have. And they said the communists took it away, the fascists took it away. They didn't uh, want to talk to them. I didn't want, I didn't look for the money, but they want, my children wanted to go. And they demanded the money. He said, if you demand it, pay the taxes for 60, 70 years what you didn't pay, then maybe we will talk. But I didn't want for them nothing. I went to show them the place where I was born, where I went to the Talmud school, and I showed them the place. Do you remember the address of your home? If I remember. Do you remember the address of the house? The number? I have a head from this debris in Chapo Utsa Huson Kilent. And we have places in Hoidu Soboslo. We have many, many properties, but I still have from the from the government of my father's name. But forget it, I don't want from them nothing. I never wanted nothing. My children wanted. Where did you go to school? I never went to school. <laughs> I went only to Talmud school, but I was a very smart child. I know Talmud very, very it's not easy Talmud to study, but I was studying because in my mind was made what my father and my grandfather and the rabbi said, if you study Torah, you make a mitzvah, and then Messiah will come. This was, I studied for a religious point, and I studied from knowledge. And where did you go to study Talmud? Where? When? Age three, four, five, six, all the life I went to higher and higher. To go to Satmar, to this rabbi, to this famous rabbi, I was uh, 11, 12 years old. And they took me because I was a very good student. Can you tell me a bit more about Satmar? What is it and why did you go? What? What is the Satmar tradition? The tradition? to learn Torah, Bible, Torah, and to pray, and to behave like a Jewish religious, ultra-religious parents raised them. And is Satmar Hasidic? Satmar is more than Hasidic. They are exactly, to give you an example, like Nature Karta in Yerushalayim, anti-Zionistic, anti anti-Israelis, they didn't want to hear nothing from Zionism. They have only God. Did you stay and live in the yeshiva or did you go each day? I would never leave the yeshiva, but one day the rabbi, his name was Harav Moshe Stern. He was the Rav Rashi in Debrecen. He was a survivor too, he survived the concentration camp. He gave a speech to the parents. He said to the parents, watch out your children, because exists a Jewish organization in Debrecen, and this Jewish organization called Shomer Hatzair. And they raised the Jewish new children, teenagers, anti-religious, they don't eat kosher, boys and girls are together, and the girls behave like hookers. And I heard the rabbi say hookers, I know what hookers is. 
but it uh, was a very ugly word in Hungary to say, who cares? And from a rabbi, and I told my father, Daddy, today I'm not coming home from lunch. I go to my friend. I don't want to tell him where I'm going. I went to the city. I said, I have to find out this organization. And I found out this organization. I knocked on the door with a black hat, with a piles like this. Soon they opened the door, they closed the door, and I put my feet to the door. I said, you don't close the door. You let me in, I have a message to you. And I told them the message, what i telling you. And they let me in. And I asked them, what is this organization? She said, Joshua, after what you said, we are not close to this, what the rabbi said. We have a box, we collect money. For what? To buy property in Israel, in Palestine, not Israel. When people will come to Palestine, they will have a home. It was written, Karen Kayemet Israel. It's a beautiful organization, and I loved it, but I never took a part. I said, it's a beautiful organization. What else you teach them? We teach them self, self-protecting yourself. I said, what is self-protecting? When the fascists beat you up, you don't write from a shelter for help. You stand up. If they beat you, you beat it back. I said, this is a very beautiful education. And at least, and not at last, I asked, where are the hookers? And he said, please don't say that. I said, I don't say. I'm telling you the name of the rabbi. I said what the rabbi told. And I looked at the girls, beautiful, young, 14, 15 years old girls, not mini dress, you know, long dress and shirts, not long, nothing, nothing against the the behaving of a Jewish or not Jewish girl. I said, they look to me very beautiful, beautiful behaving. And they were dancing and they asked me, Joshua, would you dance? In all my life, I was dancing with the Torah like a crazy guy, the Torah. I never hold a hand for a girl. And here I have beautiful girls and they want to dance with me. They want to hold my hand. I was in heaven. I would like to dance a year. And that's it. Then I decided, I told them, listen, I don't know who I will be able, write down my name. I'm a member from now on in the Shomer Atzair organization. It's easy to say, but to go home to tell your parents, this would be the same thing that today somebody would come home would say that I am in the KKL a member. This was, this was a tragedia. But I said, tragedia here, tragedia here. I'm no more Joshua. I'm different. And to cut down the pious and to throw away the head and throw away that feeling and not to pray, you can go to parents who raise you. I love them and they were beautiful people. In this time, my father was in the Hungarian army, 1942, in the Hungarian real army. And one day my father came home, he was an officer. He came home, not in the uniform, he came home a chauffeur on his shoulder in a yellow ribbon and a mug and David. I said, Daddy, where is the uniform? He said, Jewish people cannot be no more soldiers. We slave laborers. And I didn't cut down my pious because I was afraid from my, not afraid personally. I was embarrassed to tell my parents that I left the Jewish religion, not to pray, to cut down the pious, not to laniach tefillin. No, it didn't fit me. Brothers, a sister, beautiful. I was waiting a time that will come that I can't stand up. After four weeks or six weeks, 
they took my father to Siberia, slave labor. And I was respecting my father more than my mother. I loved them, both of them, but my mother was a stronger woman. My father was very gentle, gentle, behaving, rabbi, God, and religious. Soon he left on the train to Siberia. I went to the barber. I cut down my pious. I threw away the head, and I said, my mother, Emma, I don't pray no more. I'm no Jewish no more. I will behave different. I was crying from the parents, from the uncle, from, the, from my brothers. It wasn't a simple procedure, but I didn't ask. I went to the barber, he cut it, I threw away the head. You know, for a religious boy to throw away a head is a terrible, big sin. And I have beautiful hair. And I changed my look. And I sent from now on, I told my brother, I am not asking places, shelter to save me. They, I will come, you come with me. You go for shelter, you leave me alone. And they beat me up, but I beat back. And what more they beat me, more wild I get, and more stronger I get. I said, this is the place where I belong. And this saved my life of surviving the concentration camp too. Okay. <coughs> Keep all this time. Joshua, did you have brothers and sisters? I have two brothers and one sister. My sister's name was Mogda. My brother's name was Tzvika and my little brother was Meerke. In Hungarian name, they called him Bondi. It's a very popular name in Hungary, Bondi. And my grandchild named Judicus child, I called him Eitan Meyer Bondi. Bondi was before the Bar Mitzvah, before 13 years, when they arrived to this place Saturday morning. You see the place? They went the same day to the crematorium with her, with his mother. And when you arrive to Auschwitz, you stand in front of Mengele. I don't know who is Mengele, what is Mengele, but he was Mengele. And thousands of people we arrived. And they were staying there, Mengele, with the SS guys, with their dogs, and they said here and there, I don't know what is here, I don't know what is there. But I know one thing, they said my brother and my mother to go there. And for me they said go there. And I don't know what is here and there, but I want to go with them wherever they go. I don't know wherever they go to die, I want to die with them, but I didn't think of dying, but they had. And they beat me up two or three times and I went only back to me. And then they gave a dog, the dog jumped to me, threw me to the ground, then I said, Joshua, don't be smart, you cannot find them. They said, go there, and I went there, and I didn't go with them. If I go do with them, I would go in the chimney and smoke the same day like they went. How did you know it was Mengele? I don't know, but later they said this. I know that he's the boss because, you know, with eyeglasses, you know, and I see people looked his command, but he didn't talk to no, nobody. He was staying with a stick. And for me, they said, go there. I was tall, athletic. I don't know. He wanted to, not to save my life, but he wanted me to work, and he decided this guy is not for the crematorium. Not I decided. If I would not to a crematorium, I would go to the crematorium too, go to the gas chamber. I didn't want to save my life. But after a fighting, I decided I cannot find them. I went to the site, then they, from there, they took me to Birkenau, and I was in Birkenau. And when did you find out that the man's name was Mengele? only after the war. Who looked names or who cares, Mengele, not Mengele? I know SS Gestapo. 
So your brothers and sister, who was the oldest and who was the youngest? What were their... Just I was the third one. Mar Mark the, Markle was the oldest, and then Tzvika, and then Joshua, and Bondi. Your older siblings, did they go to yeshiva too? No. They went to elementary school. Haider. Haider elementary school. And then what? And then, uh, then is, uh, they went the higher. Then they went higher to elementary school. But never high school or this one. Never this one. If they would finish the young age in the Talmud, then they will go in a higher age of Talmud. But basically, all family life was Talmud, Torah study. You said that your father was in the military. Yes. When did he join the Hungarian military? He was all the time in the military when he had to go. But when before the war, they called him in. He was in the reserve army, the military, until they stripped him from the uniform and they sent him to Siberia. And he survived Siberia. And people who was with him in Siberia, they said he was the only one in Siberia who kept the kosher food. Not kosher, but what he knows is not kosher. He give it away. And he know when it's the holidays, he knew everything in his brain. He was very smart, very smart in Talmud. But he never went. Not my grandparents never went in elementary school. But they were intelligent, smart people. So tell me about your father's military career when he was a young man. When did he first join the military in Hungary? I don't remember, but I, re I remember when I got older, uh, then he, when they, I remember only the military, when they called him up from reserve after 42, after the world, when the World War II, when the German invaded Hungary, then they called him in. And at this time, they took Jewish soldiers to the reserve. So did he go to the military with a beard and pious? No, <laughs> nothing. But I was very proud of him to see a soldier. I tell you why. Because the Hungarian army was the law. When on the streets we used to go with him to the Bet Knesset, to the congregation, when every, any soldier came across him, not important that the soldier came with his girlfriend or with his wife. Six feet we saw my father there to salute to him. And six feet after they passed my father, then he has the right to take down his hand. He didn't ask if he's Jewish because no, no, no Jewish or no Jewish officer, uniform officer. They didn't even come to us to beat us up when we went with him. Was it typical for a religious Hasidic Jew to be in the military? It wasn't easy. It was never easy because they tried to keep kosher, it didn't exist. They tried to keep Shabbat. And most of them, they tried to pay out with money not to go to the military. But not all the time, they succeed. Many, many people tried to say they are deaf. And then came another officer and put down uh, money on the floor. And the guy said, you don't look to me deaf. You heard the noise. And many people tried to pay that they are crazy. And they said, they are not, you are not crazy. They tried everything to manipulate the government not to go to that with money with everything, but this was, wasn't easy. Did he fight in the First World War? No. No. You said that your father had a lumber business. Did you go to the business? I, when I wasn't studying, I wasn't. I liked it, you know. People were working, you know. I liked this, you know. It was. Uh, a very funny business, you know, you have been traveled with him to Ukraine. 
when he bought the uh, forest and to see how they cut out the 10, 20 feet high wood and how they put them together. And the lake started three feet was the lake. The, the place of the lake called the Tarajo, R-R-A-H-O, Rajo. And R the lake Tisa started in Rajo. And from this place, they took 100 or 200, 300 feet where this get wider, and they put together this wood like this and this, and the flow of the water took it down 10, 20 kilometers to the rail station. And we used to, we used to take the children with us. But not before he went to the rabbi to ask if he can buy this for it. He controlled everything. He said, yes, sender, buy this for us, you will be lucky with it. Which rabbi? Satmer Rabbi, the Yoilish title was his name. Everything my father did only with his permission or his advice. Did your father have a personal relationship with the rabbi, with Teitelbaum? They had hundreds of followers, thousands of followers, a very famous organization. People come from the whole world to him for blessing and for, for marriage life and for all the time, everything was the rabbi. He was the God. When you went to yeshiva, where was the Satma yeshiva? In Romania. But Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, this were almost the same thing. The, every place they speak, they spoke Hungarian, they spoke Yiddish, and the border was open. You know, you didn't need passport. We have to change the train because the train in Czechoslovakia was wider and the train in Hungary was different try than chain, but no problem to travel. Describe the yeshiva to me. Hmm? Describe the yeshiva. The yeshiva you study day and night. And uh, we were eating every day in, uh, by other family didn't exist a restaurant, didn't exist nothing. Every one day we were eating by this family, one day by this. This was the rule. And my father, all the time, we looked for guests to invite to our home. This was, we never, in a table holiday, we told to bring from the congregation, they called this in Hebrew, Orchim. Orchim, is in Hungarian language, beggars. But they were not beggars. They were people who came from the villages to the city to make a little bit money. They sold the bottom of the shirt and the bird came, this, and they wouldn't be able to go back to the family and nobody could go in a hotel. And nobody, a restaurant didn't exist as from the congregation every person took home people to, and I love this. So when you went to the Satma Yeshiva, where did you live? Where did you sleep? We had a place where to live, but not where to eat. The Yeshiva had a place, nothing special, we had a bed and a room, nothing special. And basically, I don't remember if we had a shower, I think we never had a shower. We used to go every day in the mikve. You know what the mikve is? The people where they go under the water to make themselves clean. We went every day to the mikve before we prayed. This was the rule. We couldn't step down from the bed walking two feet before you didn't wash your hand. How many people studied in the yeshiva? Hundreds. It existed in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, hundreds of yeshivot, hundreds, a lot, but was different. Satmer was the highest level. They didn't, like Harvard here in America, <laughs> they didn't take everybody. You have to have a knowledge. You have to be that they will take you. 
and they didn't have a problem for me. First, from my father's side, because he was very well known by the rabbi. Not only visiting him, when you go to visit, you have to bring a little bit money. And second, I was a good student. And I was really a good student. I believed in every bullshit what they said. I believed in it. And I'm telling you again and again, nothing better in your life to believe in something. Because if you don't believe, you cannot exist. And I said it to my children too, and I say it to everybody. Jewish children have to raise Jewish religious tradition, Zionistic, for the state of Israel. Christian, Christian tradition. Jesus, whatever they want. Muslim, Muslim tradition. But first, we have to help the Jewish community because we are Jewish. And if we have enough, then we have to help the Christian. And if we help the Christian, we have to help the Muslim. They were, we were never educated of hatred. And I never had any hatred. But first was my family. Even today, I don't care of the kosher or not kosher. I can buy chicken by Rolf for 57 cents. I don't have to pay $2.90 for kosher. What's the difference? But if I buy kosher, I help my Jewish family. The store, the shechtik, everything, I have to look for my family. So when you went to the Satma Yeshiva, which town was it in? When I went? The Satma Yeshiva. Yes. Which town was it in? What was the name of the town? Satmar. And was that the place where the Satmar... Um, in Romania. Is that where the Satmar Hasidim originated? Satmar, the state exists today too. It's not far from Hungary. And when your parents were in synagogue in Debrecen, did they go to a, a Satmar synagogue? Yes, it's a special Satmar synagogue, Chukonoi Utsa 6. I remember the street, I remember the building. I took my children to show the place. I traveled the whole world with them. It existed. The same building exists? Same building existed, but listen carefully. The difference is because between the ultra-Orthodox like Satmir, today I'm a member of Chabad. Because I say, after World War II, this is the only one religious organization reform. And they are angry. They said, all this time, Joshua, don't call us reform. We are not reform. And I say them a clear language. 100% reform, but not enough reform to please me. Because you sell a lot of bubemices, and I sell them in Yiddish bubemices, and I say them in Shakespeare language, bullshit. But they still teach the children of Messiah, and I don't believe Messiah exists. Everybody who lives in Israel, everybody who fights the state of Israel, they are my God, and they are my Messiah and the American veterans, period. And they said, we are, not we are not reform. But for example, in Satmer, in Debrecen, if somebody would come without a head and said, I want to give a prayer after my father, we wouldn't let them in. We would call him a goy. A goy is Christian. We wouldn't let them in. But Chabad said, come in to my family. Be 10% Jewish, 90% Jewish, 100% religious, 20% religious. T be with us, as this is reform. And for this, we have to fight to be united. Until we united people will be united, the state of Israel exists. And one more problem we had. I have problem with the ultra-religious, but I don't like them. I don't hate them because they are my family. But these ultra-Orthodox people, 10%, they have 100% power in the Congress and in the, in the State of Israel government. 
We cannot exist without them, but they are the same people, selfish, false liars, and I tell them in a clear language, because they follow this 10%, follow their Jewish uh, style to bombs, execution, and this room. Describe your synagogue when you were a child. What was it like to go to synagogue? Happy as was. Like, like people fight here to go to the football game. For me to go to signal group was a happiness. You know, it, you cannot imagine. I, I didn't go there for show up, for show up, or friends, or discuss, you know. I went there to pray. And when I prayed, I mean the pray. Can you describe for me festivals, your favorite festival in your home? All of the festivals was famous. I liked it because every festival, we got special food, we got special present, we had special guests. Every festival, even the young people when you were fasting, the one day that you don't eat, Today, I cannot see, exist two, three days without eating. I will not faint. But in this time, every young people, people were fainting because they have to, no food for one day. I survived with no food many days. Tell me about the um, age you were when you started Cheder, and then what age were you when you went to Yeshiva? Say it again. How old were you when you started Cheder? 11 years, 11 years. That was Yeshiva? Yes, 11, 12, 13. After 13 years, I told you, when I became a member of Shomer Atzair, then I cut myself from the Jewish religion. Then I woke up, and not to listen to nobody, only to manage my life. And then came the ghetto, you know what is a ghetto? They announce you one day that took whatever you are able to take in your hand and stay in front of where do you live. And I was staying there, I don't remember exactly, two days and three nights, or three nights or two days on the street, and you stay there like a horse, nobody talks to you, only the Hungarian fascists came beat up people, they beat them up for nothing, and you stay like a horse, you don't even know for what and when. But they said to leave the home, whatever you can care. And after two days, they marched up to the ghetto. You never knew what is the next step, what is waiting for you. Can you imagine, I was waiting the day to move from the from the street in front of my home. And then when they said a ghetto, I was very happy. I don't know what a ghetto is. When I went to the ghetto, I see where I am. And then I checked my place, I'm in the ghetto. Ghetto is to carry the gate in a Jewish community, and there we have to stay. Wherever you went inside in a school or every empty apartment, you put down your suitcase and you are in the ghetto and the ghetto is closed, you cannot go out. You know, to get used to this life, to live hundred in, uh, in the school, in a room, with women, with children, you don't know where you are, you don't know what you are. But I know I left the home, I know that something is moving. I didn't know what's happening from the ghetto. After a two months in the ghetto, terrible, hard life, after two or three months, they said again, take with you the suitcase and go to the wagon, to the rail station. And I, basically, I was all the time happy when they let me move to some place, one step here, one step there. When I went to the rail station, I was very happy. I said, we are improving. I don't know what the rail station means, but I know the rail station we will go someplace. And then came the rail station. Again, the rail station, you see people, the SS and the Hungarian fascists beat up all people, everybody. It was terrible to look for me. To interfere, I know I cannot. 
because they are stronger, young, good-looking SS German uniform with glasses, you know, golden glasses. They look to me very intelligent. I didn't look them that they can be so mean and so. Okay, but you stay in the registration again. Then after they send you going inside, and they put 80 people in one crown, here 40 and there 40, and the middle was empty, only a half barrel to make pee-pee and coffee. No food, no water, no nothing. But I was again happy because I felt myself on a train. I didn't have any idea where this train will arrive. And then they closed the door. Can you imagine? They closed the door. I was happy. Where you go? What will be the next step? I was very happy that will come a next step. I didn't know what the next step wait for. But I looked forward only for happiness. And then the train went and the train stopped. The train stopped, the train went for a few days until I arrived there. And I was very happy here when I saw the sign, Arbeit macht frei. I said, okay, they want that I work, I will work. Arbeit macht frei. If I work, you will be free. I said, I'm on the right place. Basically, every step what I moved, I was happy. When I arrived to Birkenau, I started to be a little bit sad because they didn't let me to go with my family. They beat me up. And then I asked the people who were already in Birkenau, I asked, what's this place? They said, look, this chimney. And I looked the chimney, frame and smoke. I said, you are here, you are alive. What you see, the smoke and the frame, People are not here with you. God made from them a magician. They went to take a shower and they came out in the chimney in smoke. I take it for a joke. I ask him, are you really joking or you really mean it? He said, no, I'm not joking. I really mean it. You are here, you are alive. You will see later, I'm not joking. And I looked outside in the nighttime. I saw the flame and the smoke. I didn't know how to judge the situation, but again, I was very happy. Smoke, flame, from ghetto here and there, I was all the time curious where will be the next step. And the next step was, I know that I have to survive. This was in my mind. And they used to ask volunteers. And I was the first all the time in the barracks to go to the capo to said, I'm volunteering for everything. And this was a very dangerous volunteering. Sometimes they needed the people for experiment and they could, I could volunteer, they can put an experiment, how long I can be without water, how long I can be there. But I wanted to see. And one day when I, with all my volunteering, I volunteered to the gas chamber. Then I got a little bit black in front of my eyes. And the order was, I wasn't in the Sonderkommando because the gas chamber in the crematorium were special people, they called them Sonderkommando. Most of them, they were Greeks. But sometimes they need help as they took volunteers. And when they opened the gas chamber, what my job was, we have to separate the people who got died from the gas. And people die from the gas, from the paint, what they had, I have to bring bones, I have to separate brothers from sisters, sisters from sisters, mothers from children. You have to be a butcher. And I'm only 15 years old. A Talmud of Torah, religious, and I became a butcher by the 15 years, and I couldn't do it, but I said, Joshua, if you don't do it, they will put you right away on the stretcher, and you go to the crematorium with a bullet, with old bullet. And I did my job, it was terrible, terrible for me. But after I went back, 
I said to myself, I have to see it again. I went back, I don't remember, five times, ten times. But I went back, I did my job, they saw the And second, they gave more food than you were there. You were three times in good wood. But after one, two weeks, I got used to my job. But it's not an easy situation for a 15 years old child to break bones and to see the people who got frozen to each other. And you have to do it very fast because beside me was the stretcher. And on the stretcher would other people who put them on the stretcher and push them to the crematorium. And everybody has to work chick chuck fast. You don't have time to catch a cap or his heart. It's terrible. No crying. And I did my job, but I have to do my job. But after, after a five or ten times, I stepped off. If they didn't force me, Joshua, you have to go, I didn't volunteer. Because I saw to volunteer is dangerous, no more. When you worked there, after your shift, did you go back to your barracks? Yes. Yes, and I told the people, listen, you know what I was working today? And I was happy, and I, t I brought them food because they gave me so much food I cannot finish. I was proud that I kept giving them. I have more food. Eat it, they were happy with me. They said, go back again. But it's easy to say. How many other workers were used in that way as volunteers in the gas chamber? I don't know how many, but the gas chamber was working 24 hours a day. How many they need? I didn't look who is the Gestapo. I didn't know who is the commander. I didn't know nothing. I did my work. I didn't call. I called myself the time there, and I did my job because I got food, and I want to see what is going on. Unbelievable for a Jewish religious child from a good home good education, beautiful parents, beautiful grandparents, good people, that I have to become a butcher in the 15 years and sometimes to look the children from the gas, they lost their color on their face and have to break like a murderer because from the pain they got died. Did you speak to the Zonder commando? No, we didn't speak, we didn't have time to speak, we couldn't speak. I'm telling you, the Zonder Commando was special, three people, 300, 400 people. And these people, after two or three months, they put them in the gas chamber too, because the German didn't want that nobody survives can tell what they did, what they saw. All of them, all of the Zonder Commando who worked in the Zonder Commando, I don't know exactly after two months or three months work, they were put in the crematorium. Where exactly did you work? Hmm? Where exactly did you work? In the gas chamber. Do when you know which one it was? I don't, I don't know. It was many gas chambers. Did you go downstairs? No, I never went downstairs. I was walking inside. I never went downstairs. I went inside, opened doors, and the gas was cleaned. And what my job was, the order to take them. I, I, I spoke a perfect Yiddish. I know a little bit German. Every day I was learning more in German, German. I know what I have to do. I didn't ask questions. I was waiting. When the food is coming, the food. You know what food is? When the food is coming and how much they will give me and to do my job. Did you see the crematorium? No. Why? No, I never, but they didn't take me there. They didn't take me for sightseeing. They took me for work. After the work, I marched back to Birkenau. It's a two or three kilometer. I don't know. I didn't mention it, but I was very strong. I was never tired. I didn't look. They said, finish. And they marched us back. The capo or the SS, the pen. They didn't put us on a bus or a train. So two or three kilometers, I don't remember. Did you, um, do you remember whether the SS were there? No. 
not for. But to tell you something, you see this picture, you see this picture when I went to Berlin six, eight months ago to the trial, he didn't deny it that he was in Auschwitz in the gas chamber. He, he, he said he was there. And I was, you see the picture, you, you straight, Rachel was with me. And I went with Rachel, with Alexandra. And the judge, I look at the judge, a good looking blonde lady, nine judges was on the stage. I looked at her very sharp. And basically the human being, if you look at somebody, they feel that you are watching. I was looking at her three hours. I wanted to talk to her. She didn't even want to have with me her eye contact. And they gave the verdict for this guy, what you see here, five years in jail. They didn't let me to talk. But anyway, I have 40 lawyers or 30 lawyers behind me, 30 TV stations behind me, in front of me, and 250 people in the courtroom to hear. I raised all my hand, but the end I gave, when they gave the verdict five years in jail, I said, I want to give my verdict for this SS commander. And people, the, not the judge, people listened to me. My verdict was to let him out right away from the jail. And not to give him not one dollar punishment. And they look at it. But I have a wish. Every year you have the march of the leaving to Auschwitz. I want to meet him in the gas chamber where he was in the gas chamber where I was, not with hateness. I want to talk to him, grandpa to grandpa, and a soldier to a soldier. Because with this verdict, I was thinking that other SS will come forward and they will say, I was in the dead marsh from Birkenau to Dachau, 1,000 kilometers. Thousands of people died on the way and I was once of the marcher. And I was looking maybe an other SS will come forward like he, that say I respect him. I don't have hateness, but nobody came. He's in the jail. I want to ask you a bit more about the gas chamber. Do you remember what the building looked like? Everything looks the same thing. All the barracks, I was in Mary Barracks, I was in 10, 9, 7, 11, 18. How, do, how this change, how they order, I don't know exactly, but it wasn't different. I know we have one, two, three, four levels to sleep. And I was very strong. And the first thing that they ordered, you have to go to sleep. I, I was very strong and very fast how to climb up on the fourth one. Because if you slept on the lower one, everybody who made pee on the top, on the third or the second, came up to the first. And I didn't like to get up wet from urine. As what I did, I don't care if I throw down people beside me. I want a gentleman. I looked, how can I get the faster move to go on the top, that nobody make pee on me. As I became basically, when my children asked me, Daddy, how did you survive? And I said, very simple, I became an animal. I really I became an animal. What do you mean, I became an animal? Listen, usually you have to say, please, you are older than me, go. Not to fight with your hand, to throw everybody down and to go down. You fight for your life. Very simple. If you don't become an enemy, you wouldn't survive. Did you kill? Hmm? Did you kill? If I cared? No, I didn't care. I cared only I want to survive. Did you kill anybody? No. No. But you don't have to kill. People died on the right, on the front. Listen, in Dachau, to give you one example, 
I was in Mirdorf in Dachau, where tens of thousand people died. I never saw an SS put a bullet in one, never. When the first day I arrived to Dachau, I saw people coming home from work. All of them, they looked like dead people, all of them. I asked them, why are you, what are you working? He said, we have to carry 50 kilogram cement of our shoulder and to go 24 steps to the mixing machine. And I said to myself, 50 kilogram is 100 pound. And I'm 50 years old, how will I will be able? And I said, if you cannot carry it, he said, no problem. We have two choices. If for any reason you fall on your knees that you cannot go up with the 50 kilogram cement, they get the order or throw you in the mixing machine alive or carry you down and to put you one of each other. I said, Joshua, you cannot afford this luxury thing, but you will have to do it. And the first day, I couldn't go up on my feet. I went on my knees, but I carried the 50 kilogram cement. And who couldn't carry the 50 kilogram cement, listen carefully, it was two way, or they gave the order, what I got this order, not once, put them up, throw them alive in the mixing machine. What the order was to carry them down and to put them one of each other, and all of them, they were alive. And then I made a picture. Joshua, you cannot be carried down here because all the people in the evening, when you got the order to put them on the trucks, to deliver them in the crematorium, they were all alive. They were asking for help. I decided if I, for any reason, would be not able to go up with 50 kilograms of cement, I will not wait for the verdict, carry him down. I will drop myself in the mixing machine. And I was happier to put people in the mixing machine because I know one day I will jump after them because in the mixing machine, you suffer 30 seconds. But then they could suffer one or two days alive without help. No Kaiser, no Caesar Sinai. And one more later, I could carry two sacks of cement, 100 pound. And so did you put, hmm? uh, did you put them in the mixing machine? Did you put them in the mixing machine? The mixing machine, I, I saw it the whole day, 10, 12 hours. I saw it, I throw in people with these two hands. I picked them up, they couldn't go up, they dropped for any reason. I picked, I picked them up with the happiness because I, will, I know that I will follow them one day. To prepare yourself is easier than you get surprised. I know that I never wanted to get it done. When I put them in, I know they will suffer five seconds, ten seconds, and that's it. But this was the order. What was the machine precisely? They were building an underground runway. You need a massage? No. <laughs> Don't get scared for my story. This is not a story. Tell me, what was the mixing machine? The mixing machine, we were building an underground runway for the messers made what they manufactured. Every, they still exist. I was there with my children. Not the whole, they still exist. Tens of thousands of people died there, and tens of thousands of people were there, and I was one of them. The camp was one was Mildorf, where I slept, where I worked. In the other side of the runway airport was Waldlager. But tens of thousands of people, 24 hours a day, were there. It exists until today. So the mixing machine did what? 
a mixing machine. Did you ever see a mixing machine? Go to La Brea in Los Angeles. Go ask the owner, I want to see all the mixing machine. You will see, you put in cement, water is coming automatically, and trucks are coming, they fill it up, and they take it to building. This wasn't building for killing prisoners. This was built to manufacture mixing cement. So I need to be clear. Inmates who were going to die, or had already died, were thrown into the mixing machine. Or you dry, or, do, or you alive. No middle section. People were in the mixing machine. They, they got in pieces. You couldn't find them in building. The, the mixing machine goes to the, to the, where they run the ready-made cement. Did you ever see a mixing machine? If no, go to look. They will show you. If no, go to the trucks where they labor mixing cement, and you will see how they make the roof or the everything. Mixing machine. It's a very simple procedure. And were the SS involved in that process of... No. This was management, capos, I saw soldiers. But who looked around? You don't have time to look around. You did your job. You became a robot. I know I have to go. I have to go up and I have to come down. Then I know I go home to sleep and I got food. No middle, no, no, no middle way. And you said, how could you do such a thing to pick up somebody? I know that I will, I will do it myself, that I, nobody will do it for me. Because to carry it down, all the people, when I came, the, I got the order to put them on the truck, and they delivered it in truck to the crematorium, most of them, they were alive. As you became an animal, life of my life or his life, it doesn't matter. Normal people cannot do it. But you are a slave. And not I did it. In Dachau were tens of thousands of people who died. And I met the consular of Germany in Dachau on a memorial day. I will never forget it. I love her, a wonderful woman. And you know, when I was with my children in Dachau, and we were special celebrating a memorial day, I didn't know how to approach a councillor of Germany, how to behave, how to go to her. She was around with 10, 20 bodyguards and they opened the ring to go to her, in front of her. And in Europe, is regular to go to a woman to kiss her hand. It's not sex harassment. And I said, Joshua, you do what, what you know. You will bow, you will kiss her hand, and then you will wait. She talks to you, you will talk. You don't talk, you don't talk, you back up, the guards will tell you. When I bow down and I kiss her hand, she said, I said, if she asks me for here, I will give for here too. And I kiss her both hands. And then I hugged her. I said, if you permit one kiss, I give you two, and I will hug you. She didn't push me away. This was for me, can you imagine, a toilet cleaner from Los Angeles to go to kiss a councillor of Germany who come for the memorial day. I was with my four daughters, Judika, Markel, Rachel, Alexander, and to go to all these places where I was sleeping, where I was working. And I looked up, I didn't remember which place, which mixing machine I throw in people, and many mixing machines. This, this, this runway was kilometers long. It's not hundred feet, and they bombarded it after the World War II. 
but they couldn't demolish the whole thing. And my children asked me, I said, I don't remember. For me, Mildorf is Mildorf. This mixing machine, this machine, I don't remember. But can you imagine I stayed there, Joshua Kaufman, Israel Army soldier, to stay there for four beautiful children, and they asked me, Daddy, which mixing machine did you throw in, throw in people alive? And I look at myself, I look at them. How can you answer to them? How can you explain to them? How can you explain yourself? And I'm Joshua, I did it. It's not from Sinlelis movie. It's not a, I'm not a storyteller. I said everything where I was, where I came, and what I did. I was there with them in Dachau for two days. And the funniest day one, it was a very cold day when we visited Dachau. And I saw a lot of tourist team coming. And all the guys of the tourist team, I was sure they are Jewish. One is Rebecca. They had Jewish Hebrew names. I asked them, are you Jewish? They said, no. I asked the second one, Jewish. Most of them volunteer, Christian. And then I asked this visitor who came today, hundreds, in a windy, rainy days. I said, these people are Jewish? He said, no, Jewish. Maybe what you saw here, today is a very slow day. Only 900 people visited, rain and windy, very slow. He said, most of them, 90% Christian. And the most funniest thing, I became very friendly with Rebecca. And Rebecca told me, after the visiting, I want to see you, Joshua. I want to show you something. I said, I don't believe it. I was thinking right away something romantic. She wants to invite me after the visiting. And then I asked him, Rebecca, can I ask you why you want to date me? She said, I want to show you the crematorium. <laughs> I said, Rebecca, are you joking? I was there. This wasn't, you know, this was in Doho. And I was never before there. I want to show you the crematorium. Rebecca, I love you. Forgive me. I want to go. <laughs> I don't go up this stage to show me the crematorium. And this was the visiting of Doho. But for me to stay outside the high voltage wire with my four beautiful children and look inside, I couldn't believe it. But when I was inside, I was dreaming, Joshua, one day you will look from outside, inside, outside. And I looked to look outside and I saw a young couple, romantic, hand by head. I saw putting babies. And I said, Joshua, I would like one day if I would have a girlfriend or a family putting a chair like this, people. And they walked outside and we were inside. And can you imagine I go back after 10, 20 years to this place where I was inside and looked outside. I know I'm outside, I can look inside. It's unbelievable. And this is what I wonder how people can believe to my stories. It's not a story. This is what I say it every time, what I went through. How they can believe me if I don't believe in nothing? I wonder if you all believe it. I wonder if you really believe me. I would, if you would tell me the stories what I'm telling you, I wouldn't believe you. Because to believe, only if you have to be there. Can you imagine to pick up a person, throw them in a mixing machine? You have to be a real murderer. And to behave like an animal, to go in a gas chamber, to bring bones and put them on a stretcher. Can you imagine a 15 years old child? If you tell me, I would listen to you, but I would never believe it. And I say it again. And I don't believe it's whatever you are doing with this collection of the Holocaust survivors. 
And I'm not angry of the deniers either. If I don't believe, how they can believe? And I tell you something else. Alexandra is angry by I'm saying this because I said, Alexandra, I was in the dead march from Birkenau to Dachau. She said, how can you say that? How could you march 1,000 kilometers? I said, Alexandra, if you ask me a question like this, how you expect the anti shemin not to ask this question? No, I don't care that you are saying boobermises or stories, but how can you walk 1,000 kilometers? I said, this is a different question. This will take me a few hours to explain to you how I walk. And not I walk. Thousands of people with me walked, and thousands died on the way. This 1,000 kilometers we walked, we didn't walk all the time. Many times we walked. Many times they put us in open, open cattle wagons, raining or snowing, and the SS army were with us. And the anti-machine guns were between the crones. I don't remember the cattle wagons was 40 or 100 or 200. But with us, this was close to the end of the war. And the end of the war, they, before they delivered us, I was liberated two times. Once the, a group took the TV station in München and they announced the war ended. And then came another group and they took over the TV station. They said the war didn't end. And when the war they announced they ended, the SS opened the cattle wagons. I remember the station Dorno, D-O-R-N-A. They let out all the prisoners and people were running to the city because they were liberated. Again, I was very streetwise. I didn't want to go to the city. I ran from the cattle wagon to a beer manufacturing what existed 100 feet from the train station. I ran there because I saw steam from the what they make the beer, and I ate it. And I wasn't sure if we are liberated. And after a few hours, when they retook the TV station, all the SS with the motorcycles, not only the motorcycles, with the side sitting with machine guns, they chased back all the prisoners who went to the city against hundreds who died. Against I went volunteer to put them on the trucks. And I was very lucky that I didn't run to the city. I was staying there eating the grain from the beer. And I didn't attack the cattle wagons where there was food because people got killed to rob the cattle wagons where the food was for us and for the SS, for the military. And from eating, they died. I didn't run. And thank God, uh, thank God, not thank God, thank Joshua, I could go back from this 200 feet to the cattle wagon. Then I survived. Then we went ahead again. So I want to go back in time and I'd like you to just tell me where you were and when. So when did you go into the ghetto in Debrecen? 1944, 19, 19, end of 1943, the beginning of 44. You don't remember the exact date? Day, no. no. And how long did you stay in the ghetto for? Ghetto, two or three months. And then when did you go from Debrecen ghetto to Auschwitz? Approximately uh, four weeks. So, but how? From the, from, the, from the home to the ghetto, to the ghetto, to Auschwitz. And do you remember which month you went to Auschwitz? I don't remember exactly the day, but I remember it was a Saturday morning, six o'clock approximately. The sun was shining, beautiful weather, and you saw beautiful 
grass and flower, you don't see nothing dangerous or scary. It was very, very kept, like a college. So you arrived in Auschwitz. Did you arrive into the train station where the big platform was? The same place what you look there. The same place. And the first thing I was reading, Arbeit macht frei. I was very happy to read it. From then, how long did you stay in Auschwitz? In Auschwitz, in Birkenau, I was approximately uh, three months, three, four months, approximately. And then when did you leave Auschwitz? What month? I don't remember the month, but approximately after two or three months, I left to the Dead Marsh to Dachau, 1,000 kilometers. And then you went directly to Dachau concentration camp? From Birkenau, we went straight to Dachau. And how long did you remain in Dachau? Uh, seven, eight or nine months. Not in Dachau, in Mildorf. Dachau and Mildorf is the same thing. So they took you from, were you staying in the main camp of Dachau for a while? Did you stay in the main camp or did you go straight to Muldorf? I beg, Muldorf and Dachau are very close to each other. After, after one day when I, I arrived, the right away took us to work to Muldorf to the cement. No, no, no real estate, weeks or nothing. We arrived to Dachau. I remember it was evening time when I saw these dead people's face from the cement. And next day I went to work. And do you know how long you were working in Muldorf for? Seven, eight or nine months. And then when that was over, how, how did you end up on the train in Dornau? You stayed in Muldorf the whole time? I stayed in Muldorf the whole time. And we were liberated before the liberations in 1945. I said two times, once fake and the other one real. So how did you end up on the train in Dornau? To they put you on a train to Dornau? With the train, when we were liberated. When we were liberated, we were in the camp. I was in Mühldorf. I wasn't in the train. So how did you get to Dornau? The American soldiers, I have pictures I want to show you. But they, I have the soldier who opened the gate in Muldorf, Dachau. Then in his name, I have it, I can show it to you. So how did you end up going to the beer plant? Oh? The beer plant with the grain, how did you get there? I'm just trying to understand how you ended up in Dornau. I couldn't hold the American Arab. No, you, you said that you went to Dornau. To Dornau is a different story. After Dornau, I went back to the train. And the train, we were on the way to run away from Muldorf with the German army. We were on, this was approximately 30 days before the end of the war. So they put you on a train to take you away. The same from Dorno they took us again. We went in the white, I didn't know where. And we never worked again. Because from the real liberation was 10 or 20 days. It wasn't a long distance. But I have the American soldier who opened the gate of, of Dachau, who liberated me. He died, his funeral was Six months ago, I was on the funeral. So I want to be really clear. They put you on a train. After the liberation, the first liberation, what was fake, they put us on the train again. When we were on the train for a, a, a few days, until they took back the, the TV station in München, and they announced, no, the war is ended. And then we were in the train and I saw from the little window somebody hold the hand that I stepped up on him. And I saw the American first tank came into Dachau. 
This was the liberation. And then you saw the... So who's this? Who is this? Hmm? Who is this? Who is this? Sing, if he wants, ask him. Sing the song, Ose Shalom. I will buy you a surprise. Ose Shalom Bim Romam. Who yase Shalom Aleinu. Sing the song, you make him. He's my friend. Ose Shalom Bim Romam. Try it. Tu yas shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael ve'imru imru amen. Yas shalom. Yeah, you don't want to sing. Okay, doesn't want. Give me a kippa. She doesn't. So who is this? My grandchild. Mm. And what's your name? Eitan. That's a beautiful name. And do you love your grandpa? Yeah. What's his name? Eitan. Can you sing a song? <laughs> do me a favor. That's beautiful. Who are you named after? Um, the now. Joshua, who is he named after? Who is he named after? Uh, after my little brother, Meir. He, his name was Meir in Hungarian Bondi. He was the little I'm brother. Done. I'm Thank done. you. Goodbye. You Say go bye. You can go to mommy now. Bye. Say bye bye. Bye. Are you trying to get you? I would like to ask you about your arrival at Birkenau. Were you given a number? What a question. When I arrived from Auschwitz to Birkenau. Were you given a number? No, the Hungarian people didn't got a number because the 600,000 Hungarian people were sent to the death camp. Until they can use them to work, they have to work and they die from work, they erase that before we died. So did you ever get a number? No, I got the number 109023. This is in the German documentary film. They gave me this number. And you got that number at Dachau? Dachau, no. I used the same number. Again, they registered me in Dachau, 109023, the same number. When you were in Birkenau, do you remember which block you were in? I was in many blocks, 11, 7, 9, 16, 17, in many blocks. Why they changed me, why I changed it, I don't remember it. But for me, it wasn't important which block I am. Wherever I could go in and find a bed and to put down my head to sleep or to relax, I went in. I didn't look 7, 11, but usually I went back to the block where I have my people, my friend or somebody that I know a little bit from the camp.
<coughs> I think your ear earpiece might be. I have a hearing aid. Uh -huh. You want to take it down? No. Is it just? Is it? Can you hear it whistling? Is it whistling in your ear? It is on. Okay. You want to take it down? No, it's okay. I hear the same thing with the hearing aid or with the hearing aid. This bad, you see, I can take it down. Yeah. You want to take it down? It's it's making a noise. Shall I put it? Let me take it. It's on. good. Okay. I took I'll it. I'll take put it on the table. Oh, this makes a noise. I can hear you well. Maybe I hear better without the hearing aid than with the hearing aid. I don't like it. Did you stay in a wooden barracks or a brick barracks? Did I? Were the, were the barracks that you stayed in, in Birkenau, were the barracks wood or brick? The building you lived in? The same thing. Was it wood or brick? Inside one a brick sitting place where you could sit down, but everything was made from wood, and the barracks looked all the same. What different work did you do in Birkenau? In Birkenau, we made the garden. Flowers, grass, I was volunteering there too, all the time. I volunteered for two reasons, again, who worked get more food. And I went through the lager, sea lager, where my sister was, and I saw her all the time when I went through sea, I saw her, How through the gate. Were you able to speak to her? Yes. How? Through the high voltage wire. I will not go too close to the high voltage, only 10 feet or 5 feet, and she came 10 feet or 5 feet. And why were you going in that direction? Because I didn't go. They, they give the order which way I have to go. I never went on my way. Where they said we go to pick up grasses in blocks and put it down to work in the garden. Birkenau and Auschwitz, Birkenau looked like a college campus, very elegant, very nice. If people came from Schweizaria or from Sweden to check the concentration camp, they saw a beautiful camp. It didn't look like a concentration camp. It didn't, it looked like a campus of college education people. And it was music sometimes, orphan music playing when the guests came. And uh, it was clean, beautiful, beautiful glass, beautiful flower. It looked very good for visitors. But who lived in was different. So what was the difference if you lived in? When they lived in, we were tortured to stay outside for hours, for nothing only to count us. What do you have to count? Where could I go? Where could I run away? No place. And who dared even to go run away? Where to run? With a slip pyjama? So you go outside, they will know who you are. And it was impossible to escape from there. It has to be not normal. You have only one way to live there, or you are tired, to go to the high voltage and you close the business. But I never ever had in my mind to go to the high voltage. And again, whatever I suffered in my whole life in the concentration camp, it was zero pain that happiness that I have today to see you and to see people that they don't forget us because this was the wish of all the prisoners. Food, and when we were talking, that not to forget us, who will ever stay alive to tell the world what we went through. Who said that to you? 
all the prisoners with, with, with whom we have a discussion. Our discussion was when we didn't work, we cleaned all lies from the shirt. We has, I don't know, we have 1,000 lives, lies or 200 lies. Whatever we killed, they sucked us the broth red. I have open wound and the lice would run inside, it was itching. I have to make pain to clean them out, but you have to. But this was other discussion we didn't have, only to survive. And when the food is coming, and how many lice I killed, that they sucked by blood You told me that your mother and Bundy were murdered on arrival. My mother, on the same day, because I never saw them again. And people said, all the people who arrived today, Hungarian group, went to Gessinger. What happened to your brother and your sister? My sister, I met her in the sea lager. How she died, I don't know. My brother, I heard from people that he died from, they beat him up to death. Where? In, uh, I don't remember which, but not in Auschwitz, not in Birkenau. And I was asking him, Zwicka, don't leave me, stay here, we will survive together easier than separate. And he was, he couldn't smell the smell of the, of the crematorium. He couldn't smell the smell of the chimneys from the, from the crematorium and the gas chamber. He was more sensitive in nature than I. And he would stay with me. I had the feeling we would survive both. So do you know, who, who told you that he had been beaten? Yeah, beaten because who knows the reason? You never know the reason. Again, but in my time, not in Auschwitz, not in Birkenau, not in Dachau, I never saw a German soldier to take a gun and to clean a face there. I never saw it because their goal was that everybody, until he works, his work to feed him and not to kill him. Can you tell me about your daily routine in Birkenau? Who? Your day-to-day -day routine. What did you do in the morning? What did you do in the afternoon? Again, we got up three o'clock, four o'clock, two o'clock, depend. And they stand outside rainy or snowing, only mütze up and mütze down. Mütze up, this means head down, and mütze up, hand up. And the counter, what counter? This was only to torture you, what they have to go. Where could we go? Raining, snowing, freezing. You have only the wooden shoes. You have the pyjama, the striped pyjama. It has to be not normal to try to run away. Only one way, like I told you, to run away from life to go to the high voltage. And I try to talk to people not to do it because they were older than me. I was 15, 15 and a half years. And they were doctors, lawyers, bank directors from Budapest, high educated people. They couldn't bear it. And they said, they didn't call me Joshua. They called me Yenu in Hungarian. Yeah, no, it's not worth suffering. We will never go out from here. I think, why you give the verdict for yourself? If they will kill us, we don't have a choice. I will, to kill us, my self, I would more agree, let's suffer a little bit, and we will go out from here. And if you ask me if really I believed my my ultra-religious upbringing, this bringing, this brought me to survive, that we will survive. And doesn't make sense to go to the highway. I saw them every morning. I ran volunteer again to take them down because after they closed the high voltage, 
all of them dropped on the floor. But until the high voltage was on, nobody could leave the high voltage wire. I used to run every morning volunteering because I'm sure from last evening he put food in his pants. He couldn't finish it. And the first thing I was to open the pants and to find what he left over food. And it's not important. All of the food was soaked with human waste and human urine and lice. I didn't look. I cleaned this or in my pyjama, on their pyjama. I put it right away in my stomach. Before you would come, you would grab it even from my mouth. And I saw many times that brothers grab food from brothers. Father grab food away from children. You know, unbelievable things. As when you found any food, you want to be sure that you will eat it, put it in your stomach. Otherwise, you have any chance that somebody wilder than you or stronger than you will take away the food. Did you ever steal food? What? Did you ever steal food? Did I ever? Steal? Yes. From whom? From whom I could. No mercy. For example, he died. I wasn't crying for his dying. I was dying for his food. Because you couldn't exist, you were hungry all the time. In this age, when I was 15 years, and no food, they gave us in the morning a black, black coffee with almost nothing. And last night you get almost nothing food. Basically, you were all the time hungry. And when I was liberated from Dachau, and you saw the channel, this, the DVD, what they made on the channel, I saw people, bone and skin. And how did I know that I looked exactly like they look? It wasn't a mirror. I looked, if he looks like this, it's positive, I looked the same thing. And I was really bone and skin. Did you ever have responsibility as a, a capo? No, or? no, 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 never, never, ever, and I would never take it, and they would never take me. No, no, they have their people, usually they took Ukraine, and they took, that they know that they were really sadistic. No, no, I don't, they didn't look people, positive, not from the Hungarian people. I never met a Hungarian guy who became a capo, but I met many times German soldiers, Wehrmacht, who told me, run for me because I have to beat you up. You understand? He told me in German language. He didn't, he, wa he wanted to save me. He didn't say that, but he said, run because I have to beat you up. I had many times this happened to me. Give me an example. I had that we have to go someplace, and I was slow. I was slow, you know, not all the time I had the strength. Different time and different. And many times I had that Wehrmacht in uniform, not couples. They said, run faster, otherwise I have to beat you up. And not they couldn't reach me if I go faster, they could reach me but he want to save me too. And I say, thank you, I say, hi, I appreciate it. I know that I know what he's doing. And I know what he could do if he wouldn't tell me. And soon they beat you up, you know. You are weaker than weaker, you know. I used to go to steal potato from the kitchen. And kitchen was under the ground. And many times I made a mistake. I didn't know that they are waiting for the thieves. And I put in my body and they caught my hand inside and they beat me up my ass until it got swollen. I couldn't sit on my toes for a few days. I was beaten up terribly. How and where did that happen? How did that happen and where? When I was in Birkenau, 
many times, not in Dachau, in Birkenau, many times. When I went to the place where the cook was, I know where the kitchen is, and I slide in myself on the floor in the little windows, and I didn't know that somebody is watching. I took the chance. Many times I succeed, but when I didn't succeed, then I got caught with my two hands. I didn't have a choice, nothing. Not to sit up, not to bend myself. I had to stay there until they beaten up my ass. My ass was swollen, but I didn't care. I care because I lost my potatoes, what I already grew. Did you ever go from Birkenau to Auschwitz? No, from Birkenau I went only to Birkenau to work in the garden. No other job or to deliver the food to the barracks. And to deliver the food has to be very muscle strong because one barrel was 100 pounds and the other was 100 pounds. I have to keep with two hands because we went 10 or 6 in the line. Everybody in the middle has to hold two barrels. And this was 100 gallon soup, water, 120 gallon. You have to carry it 800 feet or one kilometer. But not important, I was strong. And when I arrived to the barrack, for whom I had to deliver this food, I got the first portion. And not from the water, they put the spoon on the bottom where it spots something, vegetable or meat, or human beings, who knows, I don't know. But it didn't make difference. So you had a job as a carrier. Did that mean that you could go to the kitchen? Because I carried it, I didn't have to stay in the line. They gave me one pen myself. I shouldn't share, because usually, who didn't deliver it, the, who gave all the food, who picked up a pot, and he said, one, two, three, four, and he put in one, two, three, four, and he said, four guys, this is your food for one pen. And sometimes happened, the food was very hot, and the partners, they said, you made already three schlucks. And he said, no, I made only two schlucks. And the fight started, and the pen fell down, and nobody, nothing. And nobody got nothing. I tried to avoid this. Because everybody became basically animals. They looked, the food was hot. Many people couldn't take the schluck. He said, I didn't take three schlucks, I took only one. And he said, no, you take two. From where you were in Birkenau, could you see the trains arrive? From Birkenau, if I could see what? Did you see the trains arriving? No. No, you couldn't see nothing there. From Birkenau, you couldn't see nothing. You could see only the the high voltage wires. For example, the Birkenau where I was, the closest neighbor to me was the Zigeinerlager. Across my barracks was the Zigeinerlager. This you could see. Or the worst, the lager of the politician prisoner. They had red talks, you know, triangle. I mean, I remember when they took, liquidated the, the gypsies, when they emptied the, the Zigeiner, I was, I remember it. What do you remember? I remember that I know that they make a Blocksperre. Blocksperre is that they close all the barracks. And I know that some liquidation will come tonight. I didn't know if my barrack or the next barrack, I didn't know. But I remember I ran out from my barrack before the Blocksperre, and I lowered myself in a latrina. You know what a latrina is? The latrina is, was a 100, 120 feet long seat with 100 or 200 holes where you made pee and cocky. And I went down to hide inside there. And when I went inside, 
I saw other people were already there. I was hiding all oh, one day and two nights, or oh, two nights or oh, one day I was hiding. Then I heard the Zigeiner Lager became quiet, as I know the liquidation was the gypsies, not the Birkenau, not the regular prisoner. And then I came out, I went back to my block. Do you remember when that was? No. Day, eight months, I don't remember. Listen, I'm telling you again, 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 you remember only one thing, talking of food. In a gain of food, in a gain of food, and how I can get rid of the of the of the last what ate you up. Because this bothers you terrible. You know, they, they suck your blood, make you open wound, you know, it was terrible. And you couldn't stop it from dirt. We didn't make a shower, we didn't take a bath. Very once in a while they let us in, you know. And uh, I don't know how this was created, but all of them were itching and itching and itching. Did you know the names of any of the SS? No. Did you have any friends that you, could, that you were in the barracks with? I have what friend, uh, what I was close from with Hungarian that we, because usually Hungarian like to talk Hungarian. And again, our, our conversation, no, not second conversation, only one. One was talking how my mother used to bake Turos Bélés. Turos Bélés is cheesecake, you know, like blinzes. And when he was talking, everybody was swallowing whatever he had in, in the mood. And I said all the time, don't worry, one day we will eat Turos Bélés. Only, only food, nothing else, nothing else. Conversation to run away or to sing a song or to make each other a joke, nothing, only food. Only in Dachau, I was looking outside and I was praying, and I was talking to myself, when I see the people on the street, young people hand by hand, romantic, and people, young people push children with a baby inside. And I was only cleaning my lies. I was dreaming, Joshua, will one day come that you will have a baby? You will be outside, and the day came. In um, in Birkenau, um, in in Birkenau, there was a. Um, you mentioned the day-to-day -day routine. Um, when they came to ask for volunteers. Who was asking for volunteers? They talked to the couple, not to me. And the couple was sitting the head of the block, and he knows me, you know, because he saw me every day. And he saw the time running all the time. He never said, no, don't go. He never said. And the basic is, you never know for what you volunteer. You could volunteer that they need 100 people for the crematorium, for the grass chamber today. You could make a mistake in volunteering. But I took the chance again, because I know volunteers got double food. Not to escape, not to, not to nothing, who went to any volunteering, you got food. And this was the point that I went, and I wasn't lazy, I was very, full of life, you know, very strength, physically and mentally. I wasn't cared for die if I would know positive, I wouldn't go volunteering. I'm not crazy, I didn't want to commit suicide. But I took the chance I will get food. 
And when I had more food than I have, I give it away. Make it a picnic, take it, they were happy. I ate only what I could put in. I never put food in my pantry, never, ever. Whatever I have left over, I gave it away. And you never slept with the same company. Never, you know. Again, like I told you, the strong one, all of them, try to find a way like a squirrel. Do you see a squirrel running on a tree? Everybody tried like a squirrel to go up. If no, in the morning, you got up wet, wet from urine, this was all right. Um, wet from urine for, for uh, cocky, you know. It was very terrible film because you couldn't wash yourself, you were smelling. As I tried, not on a gentleman way, to climb to the first. Even before sometimes they gave the order to go to sleep. Again, for everybody the point of was to eat and to eat and to eat. Not politic and not singing and not joking and no stories. Only food and food and food. Because if you have food, you have the chance to survive. If you were weak, you went down day by day by day. And could you see the gas chambers, the chimneys and the gas chambers from, from your... Birkenau you could see only the chimney of the smoke. From the Birkenau you couldn't see. And I wasn't interested in look what I can see, what I can see. I saw only this is my barrack, here I stay. Here I will get food or here I'll get... I looked only for the, from this minute to the next minute. To look around, I didn't... Uh... Do you know when you left Birkenau to go to Dachau? The day in the month, I don't remember, but I remember again to Birkenau to go to the Dead Marsh. Again, they, they, they asked for volunteers. They took, you could, uh, I could run away. But why I volunteered, they gave for three days food. They announced it. We leave and we go to a marsh. They didn't sell Birk, Dacho, or Holong. And you get food of three days in advance. And they told us, take care, because you will not get nothing during the three days. And you tell me what I did. The first time I got the food, I ate it up. It's not the first day. The first time when I got the food for three days, you know, what is to get wurst and piece of honey and a piece of bread? I put it inside the stomach. Why? Because my plan was positive during the three days, I will find people killed and I will find food. What is in my stomach, I'm sure I will have the will and the power for the three days not to get nothing. But I never waited three days. After the first day, I saw people falling down, right, left. I don't tell you thousand, but thousand died on the way. But whenever I was close to them, the first thing I checked if they have food. And all the time they have food. Because a lot of people listened what they said. Did you have footwear? Hmm? Did you have, what did you have on your feet? Did I have? What kind of shoes did you have? Sho wood shoes. <laughs> wood, but usually I throw away the wood shoes. I made shoes from, from the people, but I, what they were dead and they couldn't use it. I made shoes from, from rugs of the pyjama or from the shirt, whatever. In the wood shoes, it was very hard to walk and very unpleasant. But I made or around my food, discovered me from the snow, from the rain, from the cold, they saved me. 
I throw them away. I could. I didn't throw them away. I put it on my shoulder. But you couldn't walk in the wood shoes. I got it. And the size wasn't sized. They didn't ask you, you want a 10 or 9 or 8, whatever you got. Sometimes they gave you two sizes lower. You cannot even wear it. When they gave you two sizes higher, then you could put in more rags. It's a different story. But usually they give whatever. They When you arrived at Dachau, how did you arrive there? Were you walking all of the way? We arrived to Dachau on the train. And like I arrived, next day they took us to Muldorf to work. And what were the barracks like in Muldorf? What was the condition like where you lived? The rice we were seeing, we were seeking in, in grown made sleeping places with a blanket or something. So it was, you could sleep. You could sleep and you got food. If you went to work, you came back, you got again food. In the daytime, you got food. This was normal working because they needed you for work. They didn't purposely kill you. But they used it, it's all right. They behaved human being. I never got beaten up. I never see somebody, a German, give a bullet in any prisoners because the point was we need them to work. And tens of thousands of people were working there. And this exists today too. More of the, most of the, of, from the air force on the ground still exist and this is a five or eight kilometer i don't know but uh, and i don't know if i was working the same every day or they checked it other people who cared of this kind this is, was the same thing only one you cared carry the cement you get food and you go home if you don't carry the cement forget it or here or there so throughout that period that you were in Muldorf, you had just one job, and that was carrying cement. Most of them, I carried all the time cement, but was other jobs too. Not everybody carried cement. Many carried wood, many, it's a different job. Tens of thousands of people worked there. It's an underground airport, underground running way. Carpenters were working, all kind of train uh, people who, who were working to drive the train under the bunker. Many kind of job, but basically I never did any other job only to carry cement. Why, what? I got used to this and basically I liked it because I knew I could take care of it. Who was running the operation there? Who was in charge of the work? Was there engineers, all German, under German control. They know this is not, this was managed in a professional way. You know, what is this? Tens of thousand people. We didn't work like horses only to work. Every work was improving the German strength, the German government and the German army. It's not for, this was not for torture. This was to take from us work. And what more we work, what less we died, was better for them. But this is what I told you. I never saw beaten up, never saw a bullet to put in an SS in the prison. You died by yourself. If you didn't go through the high voltage weakness, you died. But you didn't have, this was, this was very common to accept it that that is or to give up or to work. No third chances. So where were you when you were liberated? I was in Dachau, inside in Dachau, where you saw on the DV movie when the American came in, 
and we were marching there with the skeleton people, and I was one of these skeletons. I don't know which one. <laughs> I think a tall one. And I saw who oh, he looks. I said, Joshua, you must look the same thing. But what? I wasn't. I didn't look how I look. But I know before I saw the American tank that I can bear this torture for another one week, maybe, because I got weaker and weaker and weaker. And you were in the main Dachau camp? In the main Dachau camp. And I saw when the, when the soldiers came and opened the cattle wagon where we were put in, I don't know where they want to deliver us. And the soldiers ran away. And the cattle wagon, the American, opened the door. And they took us to the field hospital. And they washed us. Beautiful bed, pyjama, and food. And they said nobody to hide food under the bed. They checked everything. They took it away. We had to eat everything. Only one day gave us slowly, slowly, and we got new pyjamas, and they took care of us like baby. I can never forget it, and I don't want to forget it. I see the faces. So at the time of liberation, you were inside a train at Dachau? Inside the train for other transportation. What their plane was for what is, I don't know. But I was inside the train when we saw we were inside two or three days in the train. I don't remember exactly. And we saw the German run away. We saw the soldier. Then I stepped up of somebody's hand and I looked outside and I didn't see not one German soldier there. Then after one I stand up, I say in the corner, Oh, an American tank is coming in. And then they opened the door. And then I said, Joshua, you are safe. And then I promised myself, what you see that I throw down to the floor and to kiss the shoes of the American soldiers, then I decided that one day, if I be liberated, if I'm alive, I go to America, wherever I see an American soldier, I will fall on the ground and I will kiss his feet. But I never did it because I was embarrassed that they will think I'm a drunk guy. Can you imagine Los Angeles, I fall down to a uniform American soldier and to kiss his feet, his shoes? I never did it. But when they made the film, and I met this guy. You saw the picture. Who is the guy? I have it here. The, he liberated me. He was a Marine, a Christian. I will never, ever forget when I met him in Long Beach. And people were thinking that I am the liberator and he is the prisoner because he came, he wasn't walking. And then they said, no, he is a soldier. I am, the, I am the prisoner, and I went to his funeral. I will never, ever forget this. This wasn't this, uh, an act of acting to fall down. This was my all my life a dream that I will do it. And I could do it only for him because he opened the cattle wagon. I don't remember him. I saw American soldiers, black, white, who look, and I know the, how they took care of us like babies. You know what is to sleep in a bed, in a clean pyjama, and to get food. And they said not to put food, because I want to, everybody was hiding food, because we didn't believe nobody. I was thinking tomorrow they will not feed us. And everything what you hide it, they came, they cleaned it, but they came, they took care of us day, 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 day. This took me three months after I became Joshua. Three or four months, I don't remember. But day by day by day, we slowly eating and slowly not put everything what they give, 
I slowly, slowly, after a few months. Do you remember the name of the hospital you were in? No. <laughs> so, why don't you introduce yourselves to me, first of all, maybe starting with the old okay. one. I'm Malki, uh, married, last name Rodin. I'm um, my father's second daughter, second child. I'm Rachel, um, number three, and living in LA, proud to be Sasha's daughter. I'm Alexandra Esther Kaufman, his youngest baby, living in LA, three doors down from my papa. So I want to make just an open question to you. I've been listening to your father's story today, uh, which he has been sharing in detail. Did he tell you his story when you were growing up? Did you know the detail of his story? No, he, he didn't talk about it. He, he would tell us things he'd want us to know about his childhood and family life and traditions. Um, it wasn't really until we started learning world history in school that we came home with questions. And my mother opened a can of worms when she answered some of those questions. And we went to our father to find out the answers straight from him, and he didn't want to share it with us. It really took a very long time to get him to start opening up. And when he did open it up, when he did start opening up about what happened, uh, he would tell us in little bits, more and more as we got older and as we learned more about history. So we, we got an education at school. Um, I, I wanted to go on March of the Li My sister, Judy, my older sister, wanted to go on March of the Living, and he didn't want her to be exposed to that. And when I became of age to go, I told him I wanted to go and I'd make my way. So I applied um, to the program, I applied for financial aid, I got accepted, and as soon as he realized I was going, and I was going to uh, history lessons on the weekend to learn about where we were going in the history there, uh, he started discussing things with me. So it was really when he saw that we were interested and we had some background knowledge that he started to become open with us. And how old were you then? I was in high school. I think it was in the fall of 11th grade, if I remember, or uh, the spring of 11th grade. We went in April. And how much younger are you, Alexandra, than you are than Malky? They're all a year apart, and I'm a two-year lag. I was a sub Surprise. So you were a few, you were a few, a few years, years yeah. younger than yeah. Malky. So did you learn about your father's story and, or his, your, both your parents' story at that time? My mother didn't speak much about her story at all. And my father also didn't speak about his story. I knew he was a Holocaust survivor. I remember in class they would ask, you know, raise your hand if your grandparent survived the camps. And I would keep my hand down because it wasn't my grandparent, it was my parent. And I didn't speak about it much. But I remember very specifically, he didn't speak about his experiences in the camps. He would speak about his childhood and how he loved his parents and home life. But one day I was in the kitchen, I was in my late teenage years, and the trash just had an awful smell. And I was like, this is so stinky. And he said, stinky? You want to hear about stinky? And then he sat me down and told me a story about how they were going to empty out one of the bunkers and how he had to hide in the latrine in between the, the wooden X's, and I just remember that. That's my first memory of him really opening up and telling me a very detailed, gory story. Um, I'll just chime in. Um, growing up, our father is like a really tall man, so he was always someone we looked up to, and we knew he was a soldier in the Israeli army and fought in war. So we were like the soldier's daughters. Like he would talk about Israel and um, Zionism and, and serving in the wars. And um, so we always looked up to him and it was like this heroic, you know, the soldier. Um, we had a cousin who was in camp with his sister Malki. Malki's name's for his sister who passed, who, um, who didn't make it out of Auschwitz. And she, when she came, she was telling the story of how she tried to convince Malki to go with them when they were going to be, when they were liquidating their um, barracks. And Malki said, I don't want to leave Auschwitz because my brother is here. And she did not leave. And when that cousin came and, you know, we were already in our teens, uh, that also opened up more questions that we would ask him. But my father preferred to talk about other things and not about the gory, um, 
I guess, I guess he didn't want us to be sad and cry. He didn't want to tell stories so that we would sit there and cry and be sad. He was all about optimism, which he still is, and hope, and like life is beautiful. And so growing up, I remember for young age, knowing we were a soldier's daughter. And, um, and that question of the Holocaust and, and his experience was very vague. Basically, we knew he liked potatoes. Potatoes <laughs> brought him back because, like, he would always eat a potato. We'd go to a restaurant, order a million things, and he would get a potato because the potato for him took him back to his past. And um, so that, until we got to Germany with him for the first time, um, the Dachau Memorial invited us out, and we were actually in Dachau with him. That's when the stories started coming out. And since then, it was about four years ago, um, I've learned more about my father and his experience on the Holocaust than I have in my entire life. Does it impact your identity much? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I, I always felt like there's this family. I, I grew up with friends who had big families. And I remember at graduation, there was a, a little party in the hall next door. And people had too, had too many family members and not enough seats at their table. And I remember I had empty seats at my table, and I felt bad about that. Uh, I have family that I never got to meet, so there was always this wonder. I'm named after his sister. What was she like? What did she? I don't even know what these people look like. We don't have photographs, so there was always a sense of something missing for the family who was murdered. Um, then there's also I, I've learned from my father about survival. He always wants us to be aware of our surroundings. There's something that we grew up in this military fashion of you need to know how to do things. You need to be on your feet. So he definitely taught us a lot of how to be proactive in your life and aware. Um, I also learned a lot about kindness because for some reason, even after everything he went through, um, he's one of the most kind, gentle people that I know. And I've, I've just learned so much from him. But I definitely feel like today when I see things happen in the world or something happened to someone who's you know, local or near me, I, I look at it through a different lens because of what I've been shown through my father and as being interested in his story, what I've looked at what happened to other people in history. So I think it definitely has affected me in many ways, but not in a bad way, just in a way of being incredibly aware. Yeah, 100%. But I think like my father in terms of not speaking, I never really spoke up saying, I'm second generation, my father's a survivor. So I, it's always been in me. I know we're the kids of immigrants, both my parents are Hungarian. It was very apparent that they were always much older than all of our friends' parents. Um, but to us, we were their whole lives. Like We didn't have any aunts and uncles living near us. Um, and yes, being the daughter of a survivor has impacted my life, but I would, I would go in Malky's way of the positive. My father, the way he also took care of my mother who was unwell for many years. Watching my father, nothing was too hard for him. He just had so much love and he was so appreciative that he met a woman and could start his family, something unfathomable and something he never believed would happen. So um, I, the first time I went on the March of Living in high school, I didn't really talk to the other people in my group uh, about being the daughter of a survivor. I didn't really have many short stories to share with them, but I knew walking around, around Auschwitz that I am connected. My father walked around here, my grandmother was here, my uncles and aunts were here. Um, and four years ago, I was a counselor, and at the point where Mangala stood and separated everyone, I stood there and I told my father's story. And I called my father from Auschwitz from that point, and I said, Daddy, maybe you want to say, you know, Yiskor, or maybe you want to say Kaddish, and he says, no, 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 Rachele. I want to bless all of you. Yivarechecha Hashem ve'yishmerecha. And he blessed my group, and he gave them a blessing. And that was, he ended off by saying, Rachele, be happy, don't worry. And he was talking to my whole group. And this idea where I can start talking more and being open, I'm the daughter of a survivor, and I have stories to tell, and um, I know there's so much more I don't know, but I'm really appreciative, and I always felt that my father is a really special man, a miracle, just walking this earth in such a humble way and um, such a positive, optimistic way. And I, I wish that every child should feel the love of a parent that, that he was able, with my mother together, to bestow upon us and to raise us with just um, 
unconditional love. Amit. <laughs> Truth. Truth. Amit <laughs> Vyatsi. <laughs> and this is my bank account. Where are his bank account? Your bank account is The billionaire, the billionaire. Rockefeller. <laughs> You know, I think now, like Rachel said, after he, and Malki was saying, after we came back from Germany, I start to look back on my childhood and back on my life and realize how much it affected us. When we went to Germany with that group of people, we met also children of survivors. And you just see the odd ways that you do things or the strange way you say things or see things and how it really... It, it molds you as a person, being raised by somebody who's been to hell and back. Um, but I, I have to say that I feel like the luckiest person in the world because I was raised with somebody who's so aware and appreciative of life and the world and like they were saying, sensitive to others. He's, he used to come home and I'd see him walking out with a blanket and I'd say, Daddy, where are you taking that blanket? He said, there's a homeless man outside and I know what it's like to be cold. I'm going to give him a blanket. That's not something a usual, a, a regular person would do, but that's how he thinks. He just sees the world and anyone who hurts, he relates to them and sees how he can fix, how he can help them. And that's what he instilled in us. Anyone who is lonely, go and visit anyone who is cold. A, a, a poor person asking for money. He he just instilled this sensitivity, and I think it's because of his joy of life that he has, and appreciation of life um, that he instilled in us. I, th I, hope, I hope I'm being clear with my thoughts. And I so forget, uh, I forgive Marker that he raised those my age. I oh. did do that, Daddy. He likes to say we, did, were, we were embarrassed, I guess, as kids sometimes that <laughs> so my father was so much older that we didn't tell people how old he was. After and I went on March of the Living, there is the annual <laughs> Holocaust Memorial at the Pan Pacific Park. And when I came back, they wanted my father and I to speak so that you had two generations speaking. And he refused to speak because he would not speak privately or publicly <laughs> about this matter. So I spoke, and one of the local newspapers did an article. And in the article, they made note of his name. So it was my age, mother, age. His, his age, his age. So it was my mother actually who took a Sharpie and on every copy, <laughs> she put a little black dot where they wrote his age because my mother is 15 years younger than my father. And she is, a, she's very, you know, from the generation where you don't speak your age. And she didn't want people to see how old he was. He, he says that I put the dot there, but. I never, I was never embarrassed of my age. I have to fight them that I say I'm 90 years old. Every. He rounds up. It was, but I mean, having immigrant parents, it, there was a certain embarrassment for sure. We went to a private and school. And he was, he had white hair when I was he in first white, grade. He had oh my half God. a head of white hair. And everyone thought, is that your grandfather? Is that your grandfather? Right. And, and he spoke with an accent, <laughs> and, an and he was a plumber, so he sent he us up in private school, but picked us up with his plumbing truck. And he also didn't care what I got on the SATs, and he didn't even know what an SAT was. He's just like, street survive. you got to have street smarts. Street smarts and good have, people. Yeah. The grade didn't define who we were. We grew up very differently. We had great you know, families and community and all that, but we knew how we were different and how our parents were different. So there is some level of embarrassment that came along with that, absolutely. I think all kids are embarrassed of their parents. Mm -hmm. um, we were embarrassed on a different level. And we learned to love and embrace it and appreciate everything that they offered us over the years. But sure, as a time when we were younger, there was a certain amount of embarrassment. Again, when I will be 90, I will promote myself for an alte kaker. You know what an alte kaker is? An old fart. That is. <laughs> Until 90, I want to stay Joshua. <laughs> You know, if you can't tell, we're all so close to my dad. And any day you spend with him, you're learning a lesson. If I if I take Laurel Canyon and I want to go on the side street, he says no, don't take it. He's you, still my driver, right? You know, instructor. you have to take only the where you have an escape route. Like every little <laughs> minor way that you do everything, you just have to think about everything you're doing and how you do it. And and I, it, it's got to be just a survival this is the skill. Mark, you have children. Yes. Tell me how it impacts you as a parent. Okay, so. Um, when my kids were still very young, they're now 14, 12, and six, but when the older two were still very young, I, I really, I always had a fear of my father dying. 
because <laughs> I thought, is he going to make it to my bat mitzvah when I'm 12? Is he going to make it to my sweet 16? Is he going to make it to the time I get married? <laughs> because I knew that he was older, so I always was afraid that he was going to die. And I then had children, and I thought, oh my God, they're never going to hear firsthand his testimony of what happened and I want them to hear it from him because I can't relate the same story I can't will never remember the details since I wasn't there so I wanted a recording so from very early on I started to talk to my father about doing a formal testimony and I actually set up many appointments and he canceled them and it got to the point where years went by and I had showed him an email that was I think the email was 10 years old and I said, look, Daddy, I'm saving this email in my inbox. You see the date? It's from 10 years ago. This is one of the last times I tried to schedule an interview for you, and you turned it down. And he says, what? For, you've been trying to schedule these interviews for so long? I said, yeah, time flies. You still haven't done it. You need to do this for your grandchildren. And um, I got to the point where he canceled so many interviews. One of the places I was calling that was still doing interviews, because not many were, they said, why don't you interview him? If he'll talk to you, why don't you interview him? And I said, well, I don't know how. And they said, well, start asking just things in chronological order and it will flow, you know. So I said, okay, and he gave me an idea of questions. So I sat down with the iPad and he shut me down. So then I would try to sneak the iPad and just have it on nearby but not facing him. And he would figure out whenever there was a device nearby, we were trying to lure him into telling his story so that we could secretly, secretly capture it. So I, I never got that. So as a parent, it was always very important for me for him to record it so my kids can have it and so that their kids could have it. That was a huge part. Um, so now I do Say have... Say thank you to Steve. Thank you for this, especially, because this, I feel like, <laughs> will get the whole... Enchilada. I almost fired him. I'm so glad he didn't fire you, but <laughs> to me, it's, it's huge, because I, like I said to you, I always felt like... There was All a of them of stand up. You cannot talk to Steve like this. Papa. Okay, you there's cannot. a piece of me that always, like I said to you before, there was a piece of me that always felt like something was missing because I didn't know this family um, that is where he came from. So there was a part of me that always felt like something was missing in my life. Um, and I didn't want my kids to then feel like there's this history they have that they don't know about. Um, he ended up actually doing an interview at my daughter's school, the eighth graders interview survivors, and my daughter was in sixth grade at the time. So I pulled her out of class so she can watch the interview. And my kids, my two older kids now, do know and they still have questions and they still want to know. And it's very important to them. So as a parent, um, it's impacted me for a very long time and it is terribly important to me that we have this. Is it easier for you to talk to your grandchildren than it was your children? Yes. Is it Easy. easier for you to talk to your grandchildren about the story, your, your story in the Holocaust than it was for you to talk to us? It's easier for you to tell them stories? I don't tell them no stories. Yeah, Again, no, I, I wouldn't say it's easier. No, no. I don't think it's easier. But what I do know is that Malki's oldest daughter, no. Hannah, went to Israel, and he did sit her down and talk, spoke to her all about Israel, Israel, going to the South, where he served, and he says, wherever you go, you're walking in my footsteps, and so I had a recording answer the of question. it. Not easier, something? but one thing I want you be the judge. I talked to my children yesterday or three days ago that I don't want to give speeches of the history of, this, of Israel, not Israel, of the Jewish country of Palestine. I want only to concentrate on the hundred years that I am old. Because the children today are so smart and to tell them stories of 3,000, 5,000 years it will go in and go out. But they have to know everything. I'm not against the history. Don't misunderstand me. I want to teach them only surviving. This is my point. I am right or wrong. What's your opinion? Now you're getting into um, But I... <laughs> no, don't think. Say yes or no. I am right or wrong. You are being interviewed right now. I've got another question for you. One more question he has. Um, when you say that you want to talk about survival, what do you mean by that? Surviving means Achdut Medinat Israel, Achdut Yehadut, United Jewish, because I have a fight with the ultra Orthodox Jewish people who raise children today like I was raised 90 years ago. 
and this is 100% wrong. I want to talk to them because they are my mirror how to survive today. Because I want to stop with these stories. Shabachol dor wo dor om da oleni lechalotenu ba kadosh baruch hu itzeleni mi adam. Translated. That they rise upon us every generation to try to wipe us out, but the but the Lord will save us. So his his point is, don't depend on the Lord. You have to depend on yourself. I want to raise a hope to survive today because today, after 90 years, I'm 90 years old. I go in the movie, wherever I go, I look my security, which one the exit door, exactly. which was if a shooter come in, which one I reloaded my children. I'm a survivor. Do you see a dog who smells the danger? I want to avoid this danger. If I know the danger will come there, when it comes the problem, I don't have to crush my capital, oh, what to do, or call Michael, can you help me what to do? Before I go any place, I check where is the runaway. This is survival, this is in my blood. This is what I grew up after the Holocaust and after the war, how to survive. And to teach them t stories about 3,500 years, they are too smart for, they have to know. I don't say not to disconnect it. And the ultra orthodox Jewish people, 10% of the Israeli population, they give the children and the school the same education what I got. And this is 100% wrong. This is my point. I'm not anti-religious. I'm not anti-historic. You have to know everything. But I want to know who I survived today. In Miami, what's happened? In Belgium, what happened? Paris, what's happened? Thank God the Israel doesn't happen. Why? Because we are united. We have a home. We are not hopeless and we are not helpless. This is my point. And this I say. I am wrong for this. Our, we've always, our, our agenda with him was we want to know what happened and we want to know detail for detail, the history of what happened to you because it was a history for many at the time. And even though he has shared those stories with us, for him, he, he kind of moves away from what happened, exactly what he's saying. He has, he feels like Orthodox people especially have such a belief in God that they depend on God. So he seems to always gear towards, well, there's a lesson here. The lesson is, you know, you can't just put all your faith in God, you have to be proactive and protective. So he's doing it right now. Instead of talking about the history, which is really what we're trying to capture, he has his agenda of let me, what I really need to teach you is how to take care of yourself. How does it square that he, he told me a little earlier that you all had a Jewish education? Yeah. How do you square that with what he says? It's so interesting, it's a great question because he sent us all to a private Orthodox school. We attended a, pri a Orthodox synagogue. My youth group was a Zionist Orthodox youth group. So all of our, stru like everything about the way we were brought up was um, Orthodoxy. Growing up, I never heard my father say, I don't believe in God. I never really heard him talk about God. We were just, we were living a modern Orthodox um, life and it was beautiful and traditional um, great great upbringing summer camps and everything and um, I think only recently since he started talking about the his experience four years ago he also brought God in and it, I think it comes from a point of what Malky was saying he was brought up in a fanatic religious environment he attributes his faith in getting through the Holocaust to his beautiful family life to the beautiful traditions and Shabbat and the beautiful ritual and keeping the faith, having hope, he attributes it to his fanatic religion of how strong of a believer he is. At the same time, he criticizes it because whenever someone tried to beat them up... I'm not criticizing. No, not criticizing. Okay. <laughs> whenever someone tried to beat them up or his father up, his father would just run and pray. And he was taught, don't fight back, just pray and God will take care. And he switched he, he, you know, he got to know the Shomer Hatzair, a youth movement, an underground movement who said, we need to learn how to self-defense and fight back. And he took that approach. He related to the approach, if someone's coming to hurt me and trying to kill me or my family, I need to stand up. I can't just sit and pray. So it's very interesting. It's, it's like one extreme to an another. But when he raised us, even though we didn't have a lot of money, we were on scholarships our entire life. He wanted us to get a strong Jewish 
education. But he, because he still believes in tradition and he loves the tradition. But I, I don't remember him saying I don't believe in God ever, but I remember my mother prayed, very spiritual uh, woman. And he, I asked him, why aren't you praying? And he would say, I don't talk to God and God doesn't talk to me. That was his answer. So he never said, I don't believe in God, but he basically said, this relationship is severed for, for the time. Mm -hmm. Or I don't talk, right. He would be the person in the synagogue who had the key to open it at 5.30 in the morning if they called him, but by the time the 10th man came, he would be out of there, or he would sit there reading his newspaper. There was something, I, I, I understood that my father had a complex relationship with I don't God. have complex. No, it's not. Okay, fine. Um, no, it's very simple. simple. It's very simple. Don't talk. No. I do want to say one thing. <laughs> my father raised us to go in our own way. He yes. never pressured us to be a certain way. He never, and so as a result, some of us, I would say like, I happen to be orthodox. I love religion and, and he supports the, the way I choose to live my life. Some of my sisters are conservative. Whatever box you want to try to put them in, we're all connected and we're all living our lives in a very different <laughs> I have way. only one question to but you. But tradition, right? <laughs> tradition? I have only one question. Look, when you have to be today 100% unified, coming to Israel, people from America who are liberals, socialists, and the religious people doesn't let them go to the Kotel of Arabi. I'm asking you, as where is the United people of Jewish. Chabad said, come to my religious with a head, without whatever you want. And we chase away the American people who want to come to the Kotel Amaravi to pray. And they said, no, we have to be separated. As if separated, how can we be united? They come, they never came to Israel to the Kotel Amaravi. Kotel Amaravi exists only after the 67 war. I went the first time in the 67 war to the... For, for, me, for me, it all comes to down the to the Kotel of Arabi. As where is the separation? He wants unity. He's all about unity. Okay. Exactly. Let's go back. But where does, this go back. Let, where does this all come from? There were always two things he mentioned. One was that he had an opportunity through his Zionist underground group to lead a way out of Hungary and go to Palestine at the time. And his father said no because the local rabbi told the Jews in the community that everything will be fine and God will watch us. That Jew escaped, I think, Switzerland to safety and survived. And obviously many hundreds and thousands of people from his community were murdered. So he looks at that as, as you know, this very hypocritical thing in religion where the rabbi is saying that God will protect us and he doesn't, the rabbi takes off. And then his father also had such a great his father had such a great belief in what the community rabbi was saying and in God that he somewhat blames his father for his family getting murdered because they could have gotten out. Who knows what could have happened? But I think so much of what comes back with religion and why he speaks about religion so much when really we want to know the history of what went on in Europe is because it came back to, to that moment for him. He, he grew up with anti-Semitism, but it wasn't until there was this, this like test of we can actually leave, but it was God and religion and belief holding them back. So but Daddy, you love Shabbos? You love Shabbos? Right. I wish God would create at one day work and six day Shabbos. Sabbath. And what happens on Shabbos? You become a <laughs> rabbi, right? If rabbi. someone, yeah, if someone comes to our house on a Friday night, it's very important to Rachel that she shows that my dad has some he loves, love. He's we're, like, we're good, Dad. We're good. We're good. <laughs> okay, but he's such a godly man. Whatever <laughs> he, his he, right. Okay. But he yes. did also Listen. raise us. You Listen. can't. You can't follow what the rabbis say. You have to think for yourself. That was you a big question. thing. So we went to Jewish school did with you ever rabbis, but it was always, don't. You have to think for yourself. What does it mean to you? You have to make your own decisions. So again, that instinct of survival. But also because right, he couldn't question the rabbis right. at his school. He wants the kids to Sibi, question right. the rabbis. Can you do me a favor? You are a professor. No, no, today. You are. <laughs> <laughs> and yes you are no. agreed that I'm uneducated zero zero. No. Okay, see your problem. <laughs> can you find it out on the computer how many God exists in this world today? Yes, there's how many, many different, different gods? religions, sure. Can you find it or do me a favor? Email it to Rachel. Can he email it to you? Email, how oh, many got okay. you? You are a professor, USC, yes? You have to have a knowledge. Google. Uh, <laughs> I, I, 
find it out, write it to you. How many uh, Christian, Jewish, Hoduish, Indian, Muslim? How many exist? Okay. As why I cannot choose the American veterans Beautiful. who liberated me ten thousand of people from the jail that they are my God. Beautiful. Why not? It's okay. You could. And the Israeli soldiers who Offer died that. for the state of Israel and for the Am Israel and Klal Israel. Why they cannot be my God? They can. They can. It's they okay. I'm with you, Dad. I'm with you. We I never you. met God, but I met the American soldier, and I fought with the Israeli soldiers. This I didn't die. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I don't have to apologize for this. But write for Rachel. But yeah, he and I, I wait for the letter. I want to see the signature of my rabbi. Jesse okay. Jackson. I have to add in one more thing, and I'm just dis disrupting okay. you, but this is how it is in our house. Um, <laughs> It's true. The interesting thing also is that even though he didn't pray and he's anti, you know, certain establishments, he loved seeing it within us. So he loved watching us enjoy praying and singing. If you drive in the car with him and you see an Orthodox kid walking with the little tendrils, the payas and the hat, he laughs. He look, this is what I looked like when I was younger. So it is this conflict I have it within in, himself, I grew up with even it. though he says it's simple. It is simple, but at the same time, it's really deep. He loves it, and he sees the deep beauty in it, but he also sees uh, almost the fear, or if you follow it blindly, where will it lead you? So it is, it is a necessity in life, and it brings him so much joy, but like Malky says, also, if he thinks back to his past, it is also a decision, a religious decision, decision that was made that caused him the most pain. <laughs> 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 so Shabbat is always a special time in our house. He blesses each and every one of us. He says his father blessed him and he continues that tradition. If we go to synagogue, he always looks for a guest to bring home. Is there anyone who we can invite? If we don't have guests, it's like sad. Why don't we have any guests? He prepares food enough for... He's a good cook he and he prepares food because he loves feeding people. He so he is a very godly person and we are... Um, I think at some point he did say he, at some point he did say he didn't want to talk, and one of the reasons was he had some angst and some critical things to say about the rabbis, and he didn't want us to right. be affected. He didn't want to speak. And Nobody someone, has it. He doesn't want to be negative. He doesn't want to be right. negative, and some and sometimes I see that that does come out, and sometimes how it could be misinterpreted because he's not an atheist, he's not anti-God, he's such a godly person who raised us with a beautiful tradition of Judaism, and although we're all different in our religious beliefs. We're also connected, and and um, and it's attributed to him and the beautiful way they raised us. You, uh, you and know, my mother. you know, it's a saying that the rich doesn't care of the poor, and the hungry doesn't care of the stomach. I myself, I'm never hungry, never tired, never say no, never say tomorrow. Everything what I can be for my family. And I wonder that people younger, 50, 60 years younger than me, they said, I'm tired. <laughs> it's I'm true. Not, cannot, uh, He's never been tired. He's always, he called me the other day. I was and I am an alpacacker, you know what yeah. an alpacacker. So where do you get the strength from? From, 89. from the brain, but I believe in my God. Mm. <laughs> and I believe in my <laughs> bentacon. This is my vitamin. Oh, so I don't need the vitamin. So your mom is not well enough. My mother was born in the ghetto in Budapest, Hungary, with her twin sister. And her mother was a very strong, courageous woman who made things happen so that they could survive. And they eventually moved here to Los Angeles. My mother was also definitely affected. She grew up during the Holocaust, during World War II, and she grew and up communism. in communist Hungary and escaped during the revolution. Um, Certainly, her experiences and memories were different than my father's. And so we definitely, we grew up with a very, um, our, our house was rich in some Hungarian tradition when it came to foods and the language, and uh, rich in Judaism and family life. 
My mother was a stay-at-home mom. She helped my dad's business on the end of the phone and billings and stuff like that. She would home cook everything. She would braid our hair beautifully with ribbons. Um, my mother was, I mean, we never had to wait at school if we were sick. The nurse would call my mom, she'd pick us up, and the other kids whose parents were working would have to sit there and wait all day. So she was really a wonderful mom. She did have issues of her own. She did have mental illness that came out that my, we weren't aware of because my, my mother and father kept it hidden, um, again, to protect us. And unfortunately, she, at the age of 50, she was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and it slowly, she became a prisoner in her own body. And my father and Alexandra were taking care of her at home for the longest time until my father had a heart attack. Just, you know, he, she, she, he would have to wake up with her multiple times heart a night. That's another really great he story. He did have a heart attack. It was a minor <laughs> heart attack. It was a heart attack. Uh, to start taking pills. A poof he got stuck in the It wasn't heart. gas. It wasn't gas. It was a, heart attack. It was, he was a very difficult patient in the hospital. The next day I went to... Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, we, my uh, mother said, you need to move me to a care facility because your father is going to die taking care of me. So he was not on board, but we found this great place, the Jewish Home for the Aging, and we moved my mother there four years ago. Um, and we love her. With the, she probably gets more visitors than anyone there, and she probably goes out more than anyone there, but still her life is, she's trapped. She's mentally altogether there, and she's trapped in her body. She pretty much lost the ability to speak. You can't even really read her lips, but she tries to communicate with us, and we try our best to understand her. But my parents were always a very strong family unit. I don't remember them fighting. Every once in a while, they'd have a dispute if the meat was warm enough or cooked. It was always about food. Is the food sure. warm enough? Is there enough food? But they never fought. We had, other than their history that trickled down in ways, Sylvie, other than my mother's. I mental. tell you a secret, for only for you. No, you. You know how I had the happiest life with my wife? Never, ever I told her no. Whatever she said, yes. But I never listened to her. <laughs> Yeah, we, we grew up really in a picture perfect family. And one in day terms she said, the love and the You warmth. know, Joshua, something funny. You never say no. I said, You are right. I'm chiming in oh. here. <laughs> I have to say, I think my parents tried to give us, like Malki said, this picture perfect, happy childhood. Maybe because they themselves didn't have a childhood. Maybe because we were their future and they were so focused on the future. But they just wanted to give us everything they had more than they ever gave themselves. And they fully gave themselves to raising us and giving us this happy life. None of us washed dishes, cooked, did right. our own laundry, made our beds. We never had, we had hou household responsibilities. Never, and we never had housekeepers. I tried to implement the household responsibilities. <laughs> babysitter, I was the babysitter. they took care of everything. We were their treasures. They never got sick of us. They never needed a break. I mean, they probably did. I never went we to never one restaurant, it. one without my family. People asked me, Joshua, you don't need a relaxation. I looked at them, are you crazy? I'm relaxed when I'm with them. What kind of relax? You know what, I do think we appreciate my mother more now as adults. When we were kids, we always somewhat idolized my father. We just thought he could do anything. Um, whereas my mother, she was like, my father was always patient and calm with us as my mom was more nervous. Like we would prefer as little kids when my father would bathe us because he would give us a towel to put over our eyes while he slowly poured the water down our hair. Whereas my mother was, I need to get these kids washed and <laughs> out and the buckets of waters were flying. So um, we, we loved our mother. We've always loved our mother. Um, but th we definitely are daddy's girls, all of us. Yeah, I was just always happy because I love the way my father speaks about my mom, and he really attributes everything to my mom. He yeah. says he everything comes from the mother. It's not a yeah. joke. The brain, what they have, and the hair, yeah. and the beauty. Okay, but I've got to say, everything, he's, he's such a my, my head is a watermelon. A I'm not joking. But I also want to say he always says if my mother never agreed to marry him, he would be a tr like a tree without leaves and. Um, the way he, like I said, when she was sick, he would bathe her and do wake up multiple times during the evening, but happily, never complaining the next day and never really asking of us, um, although Alexander did spend many years um, helping, but he never said he needed help from us. And he, the way he, you know, once I went out to ice cream with my dad and before we left, we asked my mom, like, do you want ice cream? She said no. And when we finally got to Baskin Robbins, we got our cones. I said, let's hang out, Dad. Let's sit down. He said, No, I'm bringing this cone for Mom. I'm gonna lick. I'm gonna lick it so it doesn't <laughs> melt all the way home. And when we got home, indeed, he gave it to her and she ate the whole thing. So it's this like this love and this thought. And of, everything comes back to food. I, 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 I have to share um, one story that I love. 
Sorry to cut you off. So I lived with my parents for over a decade. My father and I took care of my mother. And my father was generally night duty. He would take care of her and would wake up and make her breakfast. And then I would help her during the day. So I got up one morning. He always got up and made her breakfast. And then when she was done, he would sit down and make, make his own breakfast. So he makes her a simple breakfast. She wanted yogurt and fruits. She was done. He made himself a big... She, he said, you sure you don't want anything else? She said, no, I don't want anything else. He made himself sunny side up eggs, some fresh veggies, like a beautiful sardines, a beautiful full breakfast. He sits down to eat it. And I was at the table at that point. And all of a sudden I see my mom give him eyes and he looks up at her and he looks down at his food and he says, you want a bite? She said, yes. <laughs> he makes her this perfect bite and, and hands it to her and said, I would never go to Auschwitz with you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like that's my dad. It's all it all comes and back and finding the humor. Humor. And, and he's all about humor. Oh, shalom bim rava. Who ya shalom aleinu ve al kol Yisrael im I'm, yeah, just, yeah, so so I'm saying one yeah, more thing so about so my so mother because so I, I don't yeah, so yeah, so Papa. Yeah, so I just don't yeah, so want to so 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 I don't want to so 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 diminish who she was. She kept our household alive and strong. She kept everything running. She was the labor. Yeah. My dad was more of the fun one. My mother was the one who kept us clean, dressed, bathed, fed. And it is a hard job, so it does often come off as the less uh, glorified job, but she gave us everything, and she gave my father so much love, and and he gave her love back, and he would always make her laugh and bring in the humor, but she is such a strong, courageous, loving, thoughtful woman, the same as my father. She's All so white. She used to bake cakes and send me around the neighborhood to feed every widow in town. Everybody got food, whatever they needed, whenever they needed, you know, without without holding sure. back. Very loving, very generous, and they made an incredible pair. And I, I, I really still look at them as a, a pair that made a whole. Yeah, and still, even though my mother can hardly speak, her vocal cords are really weak, and my father, his hearing isn't great, but they <laughs> speak every day somehow. <laughs> And when they visit, you know, it's it's really sweet. The moments my father the other week just went and he saw she was sleeping in her chair and he just sat beside her and he said he put his arm on her arm and he just waited until she woke up. And he, I don't know if it was 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And then when she did wake up, you know, she looked at him and her eyes were, you know, so happy to see him. But he just sat there patiently. And that is the image of my father. And my mother appreciates him and he appreciates her. So it was lovely to see our childhood wasn't perfect. We, you know, we, but it was full of love and unconditional love. You do the best what you can. What's your mom's name? Margaret. In, in Hungarian, Monika. And Monika, if you were to say one thing to your father, what would you say to him? I love you. I, I really, I mean, what can I tell him? He's given us so much. We, I don't know, like, how can I say one thing? We idolize you. I, I just love him. He's so precious. I, you know, hope that I could be more like him. It's very hard to be like him. I, I could <laughs> see how we're not, how we are similar and how we're different. I'd like to be more like him. That's all we can say. <laughs> God bless him. I will get up in the morning. I look there. Then I look there where I came from. That I All started. His pictures. And as your daughter, we are very grateful to have you as our father. Proud of you. No, we are, I am more. No, you I are am more, more. I am more connected to you than you to me. Okay, but I because feel. Because you can never put your feet in my shoes. Okay, I feel very blessed to have a papa like you. Yes. I am yes. proud of you. In I this crazy world, I, <laughs> I'm the happiest um, person in the world. Not question. So and just gratitude, just full of, full and of gratitude this, and forgiveness for those times I might have been embarrassed. And it's not, Stevie, it is not false, not diplomatic. Everything is a met We are the best like, children. Mm -hmm. What would you say to your father? I'm sorry <laughs> for <laughs> being such a brat. Uh, no, I, I want, I, I, I want to thank you for making me feel like I am the luckiest child 
to have a father like you. I am you. Good to you. And I, he was also my coworker for that decade plus that we took care of my mother. He was my best friend. He was yeah. my father. He was my best friend. He was my everything. And I have so much more to learn from him, just like Malky said. But everything good in me is only from you and mommy. From your mother. What about your three older sisters? Nothing for my three <laughs> older sisters. <laughs> Joshua, why do you call them your bank account? Hmm? Why you call us your bank account? Because I feel myself Rockefeller. Because with the money you can go to sleep. What the money gives you? You can go shopping. What is shopping? I hate to go shopping. <laughs> I shop only what I need for today. For tomorrow, maybe the world end of the world. What I prefer for tomorrow. But the feeling that I have my family and they are my children, not from the first wife, not from the second wife, not from this father, not with Viagra, not with this, <laughs> not with nothing. They are my original children. And in my mind, still, I don't believe that they are my children. I don't believe because I would never dare to have the chutzpah to dream that I will have this fortune. I was sure, I'm not joking, that I will die like a tree, not with leaves, with oak leaf. If I would die in Israel, they would put me in the grave with white shot. And today see my children, my grandchildren, my son-in-laws, and I don't try, not run after to be famous. I went yesterday with her in a shul I got the highest level people came up to me, came up to me, and I wanted, he, she will invite one of them. I want to invite him with his wife, Jeff Cooper. He was, took me aside, he told me a story that he was crying, really crying, like this, nobody saw it. He said, Joshua, I was unreligious, I was never religious. I went to the college. In the college, he went with the Prime Minister of Israel. He went to MIT with Bibi Netanyahu. And he said, I went to the college. I heard the speech of the Holocaust. And I said right away, Jeff, Hitler wanted to disturb, destroy the Jewish people, and he destroyed them. But I, Jeff Cooper, I will try to rebuild it. And then I came to Calabasas, a desert, nothing was here. And I bought this lot, and I said, here I will build up a bit, crescent. And where we were yesterday, he built it up, and no donation, no help from the government. My money, what I worked, and today I see you, and I am, he became a believer. He became a religious person. And you became, don't believe in God. And I met you, everything what I did, I'm sorry that I cried. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Did we behave? Did he behave? Send me the beer. The How best much troublemaker of all. You don't charge nothing. So were the three of us this longer than Judy? Shorter. So how long were you in the hospital for? How long? In the war? After, after the, the liberation, how long did you stay in the hospital? Oh, after the liberation, approximately close to a year. We were in a deep in camp, and they took care of us, and everybody became healthy, and everybody became back what he was before the concentration camp. What was the name of the DP camp? Ferdofing. Do you remember when you went to the camp? Yes. When was that? I don't remember the day or the month. I remember when we arrived from the hospital, from the American Field Hospital. When we, I got almost ready to function healthy. And we arrived to Ferdofing, a beautiful camp, DP camp. We were supplied with everything in the world, and I remember everything. 
What do you remember most about it? The best thing that they took care of us. We became free. We could go wherever we want, Australia, America, Israel, wherever we want. We got there from America. They took care of us like children. And I cannot forget it, and I don't want to forget it. What did you do? Did you do work there? No, nobody worked. We had everything, support, supply, everything. We could have every help to travel to every country where we wanted to grow. No problem we had. Money, nobody had money, but we didn't need money for nothing. We got all the help from the American, I don't know how you call it, but basically American people or American soldiers were involved. So what were you planning to do? I was planning to go back where I was born, but I couldn't go back because Hungary was a communist country. And to go back from Germany to Hungary, I have to cross. Germany was divided of four sections. And to go back to Hungary, I should go through the Russian section. And to go through the Russian section was dangerous because the Russian were communist and the Hungarian become from the fascist became communist. And whoever came back, they catch them and they send them to Siberia. It was very, very difficult to go back, to go to Debrecen. Until I found out a way in Berlin where this was the four section, German, Russian, American, English, French. I found out the first section. I went to Russian section and I tried to find a Russian officer who will help me to go back to Hungary. And I didn't speak the Russian language. As how can I find which Russian will help me? And I decided I go to the bars where they were drinking. And I was, I looked older than my age because otherwise they wouldn't let me out in the bar. They were drinking, I was drinking with them. And whenever I saw a Russian soldier who looked to me Jewish, I said, Shema Israel. And I know if he is Jewish, he will make a movement. And I did it 10 times, 100 times. But one time, I said Shema Israel, and the guy moved the head. Right away, I asked him in Yiddish, Bistaid? And he said, yes, I'm a Jid. I said, I'm a Jid too. And I talked to him in Yiddish. And I told him I'm a survivor. I told him my story. I told him I'm here one year and I dreamed to go back where I was born. He said, Joshua, I take care of you. I will tell you when my unit has to go to Hungary, you go with me. And this happened after a few months. He gave me a shirt and a pants, and I went off a Russian truck with his command, and I went back with him to Hungary. But if you ask me, the way to go to Berlin, to Hungary, should take one day. We were traveling three weeks. They were drunk. They stopped. The cars broke down. But not important. We arrived to Hungary. And not only to Hungary, we arrived to Debrecen, where I was born. And before Debrecen, I told the officer, let me sit in the cabin with you and I will show you where my home is. And our home was like a football field. And the whole Russian unit, his unit, we were driving to my home. My was a gate, my home was a gate, 20 feet and 20 feet high. I know how to open it from outside that to go inside. And I opened it and the whole unit went inside to my property. The bottom line, I went, I knocked on the door. My father was there. He was afraid to open the door because he was afraid from the Russian. 
until he discovered the type he sought. And then he let me in. And this happened with this Russian officer who took back to Hungary to my place where I was born. And later he became a partner with my uncle who survived the concentration camp. My uncle spoke Russian. And my uncle had a Beit Marzeach, you know, wine cellar. And the Russian with my uncle became businesslike and we became a family. What was the name of the Russian? I don't remember. How but did he you, was Jewish. How did you get to Berlin in the first place? The first one, I was, I go to Berlin, I was free. I could go with the American, with the French, with the English. I could go every place, not in the Russian section. In the Russian section was dangerous, but I was young and I went to the bars with them. And, I, and the Russian didn't stop me. I had a shirt like they, a pants like them. I had big hair. They didn't ask me, they saw I'm drinking. The MP, military police, came sometimes in the bar, but they never stopped me. They, they think I belong there. Did you have papers to travel with? Oh, you can put your cap up a little bit. Just a bit, yeah. Did I have? Did you have papers to travel with? I didn't, I didn't need papers. Papers, documents? No, I have, I have a DP card from Feldhofen. This was the whole identification. But nobody asked me DPs in this time. I was free. And you travelled by car or by train or different forms? I don't exactly remember how I went from Feldhofing to, 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 to Berlin, but this wasn't a problem. Even the Americans, they took me hitchhiking, they took the song of young men, they took me. In Berlin, I find the bars where they are drinking, and I mixed up with them together. It took me a few weeks a couple of months until I said Shemaisra, Shemaisra. And when nobody moves the head, as I know, he's, he's ignoring me, he doesn't know. When this guy, I said Shema Israel, I said, what can I lose? You? He may ask, what are you talking for? But right away I asked him, Mr. Said, he said, yeah. So how did your father react when he found you there? My father was shocked. He couldn't believe that I am alive. It was a very, very happy, sad meeting because he asked, where is the brother and where is uh, the mother, where this? It was a very, very sad meeting, but he didn't change himself. He was the same fanatic, religious, like he was before the war. And how did you feel to find your father? I feel very ashamed that I survived. Very sad. Because, you know, 16 years, 16 and a half years without my brothers, without my mother, without my sister, we were a very close-knit family and a beautiful family. And to stay in Debrecen, myself, you know, I feel terrible, bad, not easy. But right away, the Christian people, I had Christian people friends from before, they recognized me. And they said, Joshua, you survived. Not Joshua, Yenu, I hung him. Yenu, we need some guy to be in our group in soccer field. And I was very tall, very athletic, and I took a part with an other Hungarian guy who survived. His name was F-O-N, Fon. He was four feet high, and I was six and something. And they took us. And the manager of the football said, Joshua, you will be the goalie. I said, OK. I liked football, soccer. But not the point. He was teaching me, Joshua, to be a good goalie, you don't have only to look on the balls. 
you have to look how to knock out the legs of the opposite. And I looked at him, I said, his name was Yoshka. I said, Yoshka, I want to play soccer. What are you explaining to me that has to knock out the opposite player's leg? I'm not a murderer. I want sport. He said, Joshua, I'm telling you, you do what I'm telling you. If no, quit. I said, I want to try it. And I was a very good goalie, but I didn't look to knock out somebody's legs. But anyway, the hateness was so bad against the Jewish people because they said we came back more when we went. The fascists became communist enemy of all of them. When the fascists fought, they said we are communist. When the communists fought, they said we are fascist. But no problem, they hated us. And I was playing goalie, but every time from every game that we won, I had to be escorted from the field because they wanted to lynch me. That anti-Semitism... Anti-Semitism was bigger than before. Why? Because they said we came back more than we went before. Because they were angry that they had to give back the buildings, they have to give back for my father the property where we left it, this was his on the escrow, it's not something. They were angry that we came back. How long did you stay? I stayed another two years because my father again didn't want to go to Palestine. The same story like before the war. Did your father tell you what had happened to him during the Second World War? Second War, he was in Siberia. I wasn't interested to know. I know what slave labor was in Siberia. He had a very hard life. People died there. Nobody came back almost. But people who came back, they said only he was the one in the whole unit who kept Shabbos, who kept not to eat what is not kosher. He was still fanatic religious. And I was waiting two years in Debrecen because I didn't want to leave my father. My father married the second time and I didn't want to leave him. But after two years, I saw that if I don't leave myself, he will stay here forever. And I wanted to go to Palestine and to live in Hungary, listen carefully, not one street not one corner where wasn't written on the wall with this letter in Hungarian language, stinky Jew go to Palestine. You follow me? And today the change is, though the Jew hated, they said go out from Palestine. And can you imagine after the Holocaust, I came back and to see this on the wall, stinky Jew go to Palestine and my father doesn't want to come to me in Palestine but the luck of the Jewish people was the lot of Jewish communists in existed in Hungary and the police chief and the NKVD you know they were Jewish high level people they protect a little bit the Jewish community otherwise they would be lynched us did you tell your father what had happened to you? Not really. Not really. But I talked to my father that after I die, Daddy, I will not say Kaddish after you. And he asked me why. Because I blamed him. And I'm sorry until you know that I did it. I said he, that your family got destroyed only because of you and because of your rabbi. And I will not say Kaddish after you, if you die. But the end was, I said Kaddish. I was praying one year, 11 months. I went every day to the shore and I couldn't hurt him after he died. And I said Kaddish in the morning, 
And I said, Kaddish in the evening. But he was wrong, but he didn't admit it. And later, after I was 10 years already in Israel, not in Palestine, then he came to Palestine for one year. And one year he came to New York. But he never changed himself with this religious, fanatic, Hasidic, Satmar upbringing. When you arrived at the house, was your father already remarried? No. He married after two years, a year and a half. He married with a woman who was our neighbor from before the war, and she never had a child. And her husband went to Russia with my father, and he didn't survive. And what was her name? Frisch Roji. Frisch, S F R. S. H. Rosie. She was a religious woman too, like my mother. And just remind me the names of your mother and your father. Mm -hmm. Just remind me the names of your mother and your father. Your mother's name was? Berto. And your father's name was? Shandor. So when you arrived you moved back into the house with your father? Yes. I lived with his father. I was there too. He, they opened the jewelry store. They were very off from the fortune what I found, what was hiding in the cellar. We were very rich. And people were looking in Jewish homes. They break walls. But nobody outsmarted me because I buried the fortune not underground. I digged it underground and I put the fortune under the under the foundation and nobody went under the foundation. They went only down. They dig the keller. I found the keller dig. But nobody digged under the fortune. And we had a big fortune. What was in that fortune? Hmm? What was in that fortune? What was in the treasure? Tens of thousands of dollars in gold, diamond, big fortune of money. Money and gold, Krugerrands and all kinds of very important. One block I, gold, you know, they have the one block like this, one kilo. They, we have a big fortune hidden in I found it. If I wouldn't go back, never, ever, nobody would find it. And you placed it there? I, I gave it to them, positive. I found it. I didn't need money. But did you put that, all of those jewels there in the I, I did it. This was, I did everything because basically I was the leader of the family because my sister, a girl, my older brother, very intelligent, very different, different side, different nature than me. And my little brother, a very spoiled little boy, they were all different. Only I was the toughest all my time. I looked like my mother, not like my father. My mother was a real Russian, strong, strong-minded. So my father let, I wasn't afraid to tell her that I'm not Jewish. Goodbye, Charlie. I made peace with her right away. And she agreed that I stand up on the street, that I fight for my life. She agreed with the grandparents, the uncles. The, my brothers were a little bit very upset, but they got used. They became proud of me. And I was proud of myself. So you're talking about after you met Shomer Shomer Atzair. Shomer Atzair. After you met them and you became more interested in self-defense and so on. Was it after that that you started to take these actions? No, I didn't talk to nobody. No, but is that when you, after that, was that when you saved the jewels and the, the money? Yes, this saved me. This and my fanatic upbringing to believe, and I believed in myself. You know what is to go when three, four people attack you and you don't run away? 
that I believe that Joshua show you are a man. And I was a show off for somebody else and a show off for myself. And I never ran away. Most of the time I got beaten up, but I didn't care. But more they beat me up, more stronger I get, more wilder I get. I want to ask you some more questions about before you were sent to Auschwitz. First, firstly, I'd like you to tell me just a little bit more about religion and tradition in your home. How, how did you celebrate festivals, for example, in your home before the war? After I was liberated? No, before. Before? Every, every holiday we celebrated. If we celebrated, not only celebrated with guests, our home was never with all the guests. Because we used to cook, not for one or four, we used to cook if 10, 15 people would come, they would have plenty of delicious food. We were very achnasat or him, welcome people to come to our home. Do you have a special memory of a special festival? No, that I know. The whole week, all the years, we used to eat one plate. Not because we were poor, we were well off, but this was the reason to enjoy the Shabbat. One plate of binzu with smosh beer, or potato soup with smosh potato. But food, like the kings eat, it was only Shabbat, and plenty. Not only Shabbat, Shabbat, Rosh Hashanah, Hanukkah, every holidays was plenty, plenty delicious food. But the whole, all the year, or noodle with jam, or one plate, one kind, but Shabbat. Did you have non-Jewish friends? I have a lot of non-Jewish friends. I have a lot, I have a very good friend. 15 people, 10, 15 used to work by my father. And I remember the woman used to come to pick up the salary Friday, because if the father would give me the money Friday, if they would give them for the workers, not the wives, he would go straight to the, in the Beit Marziach and would spend all the money of drinking. He would bring him pennies home. The monies my father used to give the wives. They came every Friday afternoon. My mother, no checks and no papers. And the wife used to give the husband five dollars, whatever she gave, and, but with the money she went home, never for him. Did you experience anti-Semitism? Where? In your town, hometown. Oh, every day. Every day. I grew up. This was hurting me terribly. I'm telling you, I told you. But I don't know what Christian, Jewish, I know that I look like Yoshka, like any other people. I couldn't swallow this punishment that they hate me. I didn't see a reason. What I did wrong, that I'm doing so what? You say that you had non-Jewish friends. I have a lot. Was it typical for Hasidic families to mix with non-Jews? No, there was nothing wrong. We lived in a not a Jewish neighborhood. We had neighbors not Jewish. No, we didn't have problem with this one. We had a lot of people, they got educated, and the Hungarian, they are religious, Catholic. Every Sunday, they got from the priest a speech to support the anti shemin and not only the priest in the state, the Vatican, Pius Papa XII, he was a very, very anti shemit and the Catholic listened to him. And they blamed me too, that I, I was angry that I didn't kill Jesus. I was angry for this. I was fighting, but didn't help nothing. After the Second World War began, but before the Germans arrived in Hungary, how did the Hungarians behave towards you? Between 1939 and 1944? They were anti-Jew haters, anti-Shemin there. 
they are Jewish. For example, in the Russian, there are not Jew haters, but the Ukraine, they are Jewish haters. The Polish are Jewish haters. Yugoslavia is not a Jewish hater. Yugoslavia took in Jewish people. Bulgaria, Slovenian country, he said to the German people, you can invade Bulgaria, but you cannot touch the Jewish people. Many countries, they said, but the Hungarian people, they took flowers of them when they arrived. They took him sugar, different. So but describe conditions for Jews living in Debrecen from 1939 to 1944, before the Nazis arrived. What were conditions like? Antisemitic, but not dangerous. They existed. For example, the chief police needed money for Christmas, okay? He sent out 10 hooligans, gang members, go break the windows of the Jewish neighborhood. What happened? The high-ranking people, lawyers and doctors and rich people went to the chef, said, please help us. But he sent these gangs to break and to beat up Jewish people. And the Jewish people bring money, hundred dollars, five, I don't know, whatever he needed. He said, I will do everything in my power and I will stop them. But for him, it wasn't hard to stop because he sent them. He got the money, stopped them. Somebody manipulated it, went to break the windows, went to, went to make a revolution against the Jewish people. Whenever the re revolution happened, the high-level Jewish people gave money here and there, it got quiet. If this happened once a month, or once a year, or two times a year, but this happened all the time. You said earlier that your father came back from the army when was he discharged? When was he pushed out of the army? Before they sent him to Siberia. And what he was he in the reserve army. He was in the reserve army, I don't know how many months in the war. But when he came back without the uniform, they stripped him from everything. He, be, he, didn't, he wasn't a soldier. He became a slave laborer. Not only a slave laborer, they forced him to walk on the street with the chauffeur, not with a gun. And they put on the yellow star, the yellow star and the yellow belt. Okay, not a soldier, but why he says to carry a chauffeur, only to put him down, and he was an officer. Do you remember what year that was? Hmm? Do you remember what year? I think in 40, or oh, end of 42 or beginning 43. I don't remember exactly. And how long was he in Debrecen before he was sent away? In Debrecen, what I remember, when he was a slave labor already, he was already three or four months with the, without, the, without the uniform, but he still was in the reserve army, but not a soldier. He served like a slave laborer. And after three months or four months, they sent him to Siberia. Were either you or your brother, um, did, did, first of all, your brother, was your brother ever used for slave labor? My brother. In, De in Debrecen? I was a slave laborer in Debrecen. My brother was a slave laborer too because the Hungarian government took us when the American and the Russian bombarded Debrecen they said we put a light, fresh light, to signal for the airplane to bombardier. It's not true, but not important. And after bombardment, they took all the young people to be a slaver. And I was beaten up like a dog by the fascist too. He was beaten up too. What did you do? The, to clean the street, to clean everything what the bombardment did. We were spit up, beat up, whatever they could do, they could do. And when was this? Before they took us in the ghetto, before they delivered us. I was a slave laborer, I have to go in the morning, I have to stay there, and they told me where to go. Do you know how many months you did this for? Home, I don't remember, a couple of months. But it's whatever it was, it was terrible. It's not for me, I didn't like it. 
And I didn't like it because I didn't see an old way. I didn't see any solution. After I saw all my father lose, after this bombardering, they said the war will end, but what? They blamed us in the newspaper, every place, thinking you, you signaled for the airplanes to bombard. We didn't signal, we didn't, we didn't have nothing against the government. We were good citizens. And where did they put you did, when you were doing the, the slave labor? Did you stay in the barracks or did you go home? No, we go home. They work and they send us home. There is no food, no nothing. You have to take your own food. You have to take your own food. They gave the tools what to work under the control of this fascism, Hungarian fascism. We were free, not in jail. And was it the Arrow Cross that were... Hmm? Was it the Arrow Cross? The fascists? The Arrow. Yes, they were, they were in control. Arrow. arrow. This is not, the, not what the Nazis have. They have a different sign. But they were fascistic, very, and most of them college educated, most of them officer, pilot officers, who used to say in the corner, the boss used to pick them up, they were the worst of everything. And very bad feeling, I don't know to go on this way, to go this way, this way, you know, wherever you went, you were in danger. But you got used to this. If they don't beat you up, they have a good day. If they beat you up... And at what point did you join or did you get in contact with Hashemeh Hatzair? What uh, year? We were, yes, we were in contact, but, but they didn't have no power in Debrecen because everything broke up. Everything, the Jewish community broke up, but the Shomer Hatzair existed. They stand up against the hooligans. I was connected with them, positive. But what connected? They tried to protect me, but how can they protect me? They were not protecting. And they were not older people. They were 16, 18, 19. They were young children too. But they tried to encourage us not to give up and not to get scared. They tried. I got a lot of power from them. And how, how old were you when you met them? Fourteen and a half years. Uh, one year, one and a half years after Bar Mitzvah. And if the rabbi wouldn't give the speech what he gave, I would never look for them. I didn't know that for August, this, this exists such a thing. So by this time, the Hungarian Arrow Cross were already making life very difficult for the Jews. The Arrow Cross existed for many years. But it, at that time, the Second World War had already begun. Shomer Hatzair were becoming active, and the Hasidic rabbi then said, it's dangerous for the Jews. Is that what the sequence was? But they didn't have the connection with the Hasidic. They have their own people. And people know who is, can belong to the Shomer Hatzair. And again, if I wouldn't belong to this ultra-religious rabbi, I would never know the Shomer Hatzair exists, never ever, because I didn't even go close to them. I never had connection. But the tank of the rabbi but they opened my eyes and told me what to do. They opened my eyes. And this helped me to survive very much. And until now, I cannot forget them. And again, the religious, the believing, gave me a lot, a lot of, lot of courage. Never give up and never be negative, be positive. Mistake, I made one million mistakes. Good things, I made one million good things. But you cannot do good without doing bad. Me a bad, you learn how to improve yourself and you have to educate yourself. You have to hear what people are talking to you and to listen, to listen only to yourself. When you were sent to the ghetto, was that after the Nazis had invaded Hungary? 
No, the Nazis were in Hungary already before the Zedash. The Nazis were, when I went to the rail station, the Nazis were there, and I saw how good-looking young Nazi soldiers beat up old people, they caught them down the beard and the pious, and I was looking with a hard break in each, and I couldn't get involved. And I wanted to get involved. Don't think that, but I know they with the dogs, what they have, and the guns and the boots, they look scary to me. It's, I didn't want to go with my wall, with my head to the wall. What did you do in the ghetto? In the ghetto, almost nothing. I tried to run away to bring some food from outside. Almost nobody, nothing to do. You were in a ghetto like in an open jail. But you were fenced around the building and to get used to sleep in a room like this, 10 or 15 people with children, with old, with sick, you know, or they had many rooms where 100 people were Wherever you put down there, you slept, you know. It was a very bad feeling to come home from a beautiful home and to set, take two suitcases and stay there. But like I told you, every change helped my life because I know it's moving. I didn't like to stay on a place without to know what will be tomorrow. And basically nobody knew what will be tomorrow. But from every step what happened, I said, this happened, this happened, this happened, tomorrow will be something happened, Arbeit macht frei. Everything I was waiting for. Like somebody is a gambler buying a lottery ticket and buy it doesn't win, but I say I buy again, maybe, until you don't get tired. But I never got tired. Until you no, know, I never got tired. Nobody heard from me, Joshua, I'm tired. If you need help, if I'm your friend, wake me up one o'clock at night, I'm ready. Age, not age. I don't agree with this. Maybe I don't agree because I'm healthy, mentally and physically. I'm 38 years a member in Kaiser. Only with this heart attack, I went three years ago. I never took a medicine. I never know what is sick. Or, and I work all my life. You know what is to work on this? It's a very hard job. It's not easy. And I was in Suez Canal five years. It's not a joke. Tell me about your uh, decision to leave to go to Israel. What year was that? From childhood I wanted to go to. Not to Israel, Palestine. And I'm not ashamed to tell you when we bought the radio, you know, the radio has a hose in the back, and I heard Arab music. I looked inside in the radio. I was thinking I will see the singers in the radio. I didn't know how the radio works. I didn't have any idea. And I used to hear the Muslims singing. I was so happy, and I was thinking they are singing Hebrew and they were Arab music. And I'm not ashamed to tell you, in my age, in this time, to look in a radio, in the back of the radio, in the hall, and to see you singing, you have to be a Hamor Garem, you know, you have to be not born. You cannot send my grandchild in the TV to look, you will see the dancers in the TV. And when I was looking, I mean to. So when you made the decision to go, what year was that? I, I arrived to Israel uh, in the 1950. And how did you get there? I went there with the sheep. The name of the sheep was Abazia. From Italy, from Germany, they took us to Italy and from Italy to, we went on the ship, Abazia, to Israel. When I arrived to Israel, the first thing was I throw myself to the ground, I kissed the ground, and I went to buy a fresh bread with orange from Jaffa. 
you know, what is fresh bread. And I finished the whole bread with orange from Palestine. I never forget it. Not only bread with orange, halva, they said. In the, did you ever eat halva? Halva was for me something, a dream. Halva with the fresh bread with the orange. Until today, I cannot forget. I still eat the bread with orange. I almost never eat orange with old bread. Which port did you arrive? Jaffa. Port, what a port. We jumped in the water because the ship stayed <laughs> 200 feet from, from the port. People who couldn't go or swim, they put them in a little boat. People who could walk, they have to step down in the water or to swim or to go to the street of Jaffa. I, re I closed my eyes, I remember the place. The ship Abazi had stopped from the, from the bank, maybe 300 feet or 200 feet. What was that feeling like to arrive there? Heaven. Heaven. I'm in Palestine. They send me, they give me $10 or $20. They give me a bed, a portable bed with a blanket, sohnut, they called it. And says, when you settle down, go to register yourself for the army and to become the papers. But I didn't look for nothing. I looked for bread, orange, halva, and I was in Palestine. Where did you go next? Where did you live? From Yafu I went to Beersheba. For no reason, I liked the desert. And this time Beersheba was empty, empty, empty. Today Beersheba is little Paris. Have you been in Beersheba? And I was there when Saturday the military went home, the whole city empty. And once a week, on the Arabs who came from Hebron here to the Shuk, they came to Beersheba. Beersheba, no people existed. And I settled down in Beersheba. And in the army, I got educated of this. I learned this profession. What is this profession? Siut Kaved, tractorist. And this is a better job than to be a professor at UCLA or to be a doctor in, in Cedar Sinai, or to be a lawyer in Los Angeles. This is the top profession. And this is what I learned in the army. What did you do? Only for the military, road, ways, highways, freeways, everything what they need, this equipment. And I'm not only to know how to operate this, I know how to fix it. I became a professional mechanic and a professional operator. They call this in Hebrew tractorist or heavy equipment operator. You never have to apply uh, applications for the job. And I have my own tools. I never worked for nobody. I made a little bit money. I bought a tractor. I was a self-contractor. But my whole life was in the army in the war, in the border, in the zone, or in the Sinai, or Ramatagolan, all the time in dangerous places. So were you in the IDF as a tractorist? In the army, I chose this. First they teach me driving. I said, I don't want to be a driver. Then they ch choose me this one. From driver, I became a tractorist. I could be anything. The army helped you with everything what you are able to do. I was a good driver. I was driving semi-trailers. I was driving very good drivers, but I didn't like it. I asked, I want a profession. Driver is not a profession. It's a good profession too, good paid, but I didn't want to be. I asked, I want to do this one. So how, for how many years were you driving heavy equipment in the army? All my life, 25 years. I was five years in Suez Canal. And five years 
every day on their war. The war started in 73, but after six day war, until the Yom Kippur war between these five years, every day they attacked us and we attacked them there. People died every day. It's a dangerous place because the Suez Canal is 195 kilometers from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. And I worked all the way these 195 kilometers. We bought mountains that they cannot see when we are traveling. And onto the mountains, we were living in bunkers that the cannon, what they fell down, could never go through because we put iron like this, like this, and wood, as we were sheltered. How many wars did you experience in the army? How many? Wars. How many wars? I was in 56, 67, 73. 73, I was five years with Ariel Sharon. And, was, and what was your role? Hmm? What did you do? I, I made the, the mountain from Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. They called this in another language, you remember in the World War II, the French people built the Maginot Line. You know about the Maginot Line. But this is what we did, this is what I did, not only me, thousands of other soldiers, this is what we did. Basically, for one reason, that we can stop them to watch us, how we are driving and what we have. And second, under this mountain, where those places, the bunkers, where the soldiers was leaving, because the main camp was 40 kilometers from the Suez Canal. And where were you during the Six Day War? Hmm? In 1967? Six, seven, I was again. We won the war, we went from Gaza to Suez Canal. The same thing. And what, we, what was your we job? we won the war in six days. And 56, we, wore, we made the war with the English, French, American, and Israel, because Gamal Abdul Nasser closed the Suez Canal, and we opened with the four countries together. We let them open it. We didn't let it close. And then came the 67 war. And before the 67 war, again, the president of Egypt announced it 24 hours a day that we will erase the state of Israel. And they announce it 24 hours a day. But instead of they to erase us, we won the war in six days. And in 1973, where were you? In Suez Canal. I have shown you pictures if you want. What was it like to live in Israel as a Holocaust survivor? very proud and very happy. I never wanted to drive in case I die. I would die with happiness. I was fighting for my home. You know what is to be when you are. In Hungary, I was hopeless and helpless. And to be in Israel and to prove the world that we are somebody. Until the 67, people used to come from America. They looked down at us. They said only the helpless people went to Israel. I have friends that went to Australia, Canada, America, and they said, Joshua, what are you looking in Israel? You don't have nothing there. And the tourists came to make picture of us. They look at Dan of us. And 67, we proved the people of the world and for ourselves that we know how to defend ourselves. Did you tell your fellow soldiers that you were a survivor? No, <laughs> never. I was ashamed because I told you, they called the survivor Sabone. Sabon, you know, so when you make a show where you Sabon, they called Sabone. They said, you should stand up 
and you should fight the whole of us and not to go like cows, like animals to the slaughterhouse. I never told them. I, was, I told them I was hiding. I was never in concentration. I didn't tell my children that I was in concentration. They were 14 years, 13 years. I was embarrassed. In Israel, positive, they would, they would look at me, Joshua, you, you are a survivor. They would look at me that. Did other survivors experience that? I don't have connection with them. I heard them, I listened to them. But what I have to hear them, I went it through, I know everything. I went from Aleph to Tav, from A, B, A to the end. I know everything, I saw everything, I did everything. I don't have to listen to nobody. And I don't like to listen, what I have to listen? And I say it every place, nobody can step in my shoes, in my age, to become from an ultra-religious, to a survivor, in a fighter, in anti-God believer, only Joshua can stand up. And never ever, not in one Jewish religious school, any rabbi or any person stand up and say, Joshua, you are a right wing, you are an atheist. Every place I got hugs and kisses and they invite me to an other religious school. Because I don't talk stupid things. I talk, I don't know philosophy, but I talk realistic. And to realistic, nobody can stand up. And I repeat myself. My child said, you know, Daddy, we listen to your speech. You say all those the same time every place. I said, Alexandra, I'm not acting. I cannot play one day Charlie Chaplin and one day acting Shakespeare. I'm not Shakespeare, not Charlie Chaplin. I'm Joshua, who was this, went to this, who became this, and everything is proved, everything is documented. It's not that I stand up. I don't have to read from a, from a paper what I'm talking, I can stand up. It can be a professor, it can be whatever, a priest, a pope, president, I will talk to him if I convince him that he cannot stand up against my speech. Did you develop friendships in Israel? Call Israel, everybody was my friend. Most of them hookers, gamblers. I have money like this. And money didn't have for me a value. You know what is it? no value? I made a fortune of money, a fortune. I went to a kibbutz, I got $20 a year. I had the happiest life in my life. Which kibbutz? I was in many kibbutz, in kibbutz Lav, kibbutz Shuvat, I was kibbutz De Boker, Ben Gurion, kibbutz Revivim, Vigolda Meyer. Money doesn't have a value for me. I liked women. I like motorcycle, and I like to spend my money. Nothing else, very simple. And I enjoy to be, but I was crying all the time. Don't misunderstand me. When I was happy, I myself was happy. I was crying that I don't have a family. And I was sure that I will never, ever have a family. Because my job wasn't on Wilshire Boulevard, or the Sinai, or Ramatagolan, or Gaza, or Aza, or Lebanon, all the time in the war zone. And you cannot be a married person to come one in four weeks, one in three weeks home. A married person has to sleep with his wife every night, sex or not sex, it's a different story. But I came home once in two weeks, once in three weeks, and to go back to the desert and to be in the war, I don't want to make children without the father. I want to raise them. And when I wouldn't come here in 75, and I wouldn't convince this woman, after one hour, I knew that she will be my wife. And after two months, two weeks, I married her. And after four years, I made these four children. I would die like a tree without leaves. Tell me about how you came to America and why. About? 
Tell me why you came to America and like when. I have a friend, he was manufacturing in Canada, a very rich guy. He is from Debrecen too. And I came to New York and he said, Joshua, I have a brand new Lincoln Continental. And when he come to Israel, he used to take my car and he used to sleep in my home. He said, wherever you want, come with me. I have two weeks vacation. And never in my life I was sitting in a new car. And did you ever sit in a Lincoln Continental? You know what is to sit in a Lincoln, a new, con a new car? Even the smell, I smell it. And I, he said, I want to go to Los Angeles. He said, California. If you would take me to Alaska, I would go to Alaska. If you would take me to Miami, I would go to Alaska. He said, let's go to California. I said, California. And he was Shomer Shabbat. He didn't eat not kosher. He went to look for a place where he can eat Shabbat kosher food. And we went to my wife's mother, Hungarian. He knows her because his mother and my wife's mother, they were friends. As he took me to my wife's mother, if he can't stay by them, Shabbat, they said, you are very welcome. As she asked, but who is this guy? Who is this Christian guy? He came in leather jacket, we thought with hair like this. I looked like a gang. Who is this guy? And he said, he's not a guy, he's a Jewish boy, he's from Debrecen, from the state, the same thing where she is. And I saw on the wall two pictures. My wife, she had a twin sister, Judy, Judy and Margaret. And he said, Judy died on a heart attack when she was 26, only Margaret is alive. I said, listen, Walvish, Basically, I like both of them. I would like to marry both of them. But who is dead? I'm sorry. But who is alive? I'm ready to marry. He said, are you joking? And Alte Kake, you are 47 years old, and she looked like a teenager, beautiful, beautiful hair, beautiful figure. And she came out, they just to go to work. And I saw she looked like a teenager girl. And I start to talk to her. And after one hour, I convinced her that she called up the company that she is not coming into work today. And I know if I convince her, she will be mine. After one hour. And I, she asked me where to take. She said, take me wherever you want. I don't know. I didn't speak one word in English. She said, let's go to Universal Studio. And after Universal Studio, I said, Margaret, if you don't have other men who is, you are engaged, who is ready to marry you, I am the man I want to marry you. She said, Joshua, it's too early. I said, I don't know early, I don't have a time, but I ask you. And Monday, she said, Joshua, I'm yours. Marry me. And after I married, everybody came up. They want to see Margaret's future husband. They asked, is he a doctor? She said, no. A lawyer? No. Is he rich? No. But who is he? She said, he's Joshua, a war veteran. And I love him. And after four weeks, six weeks, I married her. And after four years, this I made with old Viagra. And until now, we're still in love, but I wish her to see more dead than alive. To see a beautiful woman like she looks today in this Jewish home. The Jewish home is beautiful. She has to be diapered. She cannot walk, she cannot talk, 
you know, for me, the day when she will die will be the second happiest day in my life. Because I was sure I will die and she will marry 20 times until. But it's the opposite way. I'm still alive, you see it, no? And she has to be in the jail four years already. She doesn't have pain, but she's helpless. And the brain still works. And I'm not joking. All my children, they look like she. The brain, she. The voice has a beautiful voice, a real singer voice from her. Brain intelligent from her. She was teaching in Canada math when she was 12 years old to help her mother to make a living. She's ultra intelligent, ultra smart. All my children, they are not, I have a potato head, but not important. Today when I say Rockefeller, I mean it. Today I don't need food, I have vitamin. This, this, you, you know, I cannot go, I have my truck, you know, not one day that I got back from people. They salute to my friend. They salute for American to Israel. And they said to me, Joshua, it's a little bit dangerous to walk with four American, two Israeli. You're looking for trouble. I said, young, I will never die. If somebody wants to kill me, come, I'm ready. But any times I got only this, and I got this, and I got screaming, Joshua, I'm happy to be Israeli every day, not one day. Joshua, how do you remember your family that did not survive? My family, I still listen crying. What I said is a story of tens of years. I still ashamed that I am alive. I'm not ashamed because I have my family, the name, you know, the future of them. They, they, in the school, they know them, they know me, and I try to. I tried to educate this little one, Merkel, not to drink water, we told to say Abraha, Baruch, not from religious. I want to get used to the Hebrew words. I teach her, teach him singing Hebrew song. I put a kippah when I go to the shul with him, only to get used to be Israeli and Jewish. Be American and Jewish, I don't care. I do my best. And I went one year with my family to Israel. One full year, they went to school. I showed them all the kibbutzim, all the military, all the where I was. You know, it's a, it's an unbelievable feeling. And you, nobody can feel it. Only I feel it. And today, I'm 90 years, but it's a joke. I, I'm ashamed to tell that I'm 90, but I don't know. I don't know the age, what is 90 or 80 or 70. I know that I'm never tired, never hungry. Anybody's calling me for help, the family, never say I don't have time. Never, never. Everything. So let me ask you again, how do you remember the family that did not survive? Listen, how they died, I know how they died. You know, what can I tell you? I saw how the people look after the gas chamber. As can you imagine my mother, a beautiful, healthy woman, smiling face, my little brother, that I should bring them the hand like a murderer. How can I feel? But I don't have hateness to the German today. I gave speeches in Germany too. I don't have hateness against them. And I mention Angela Merkel every day in my speech because he said clear language. We never will ever in life let Israel to fall. And they support Israel with billions of dollars. And they open the door for the Jewish community to build schools, synagogues, everything, the German government. I gave it every speech that I don't have hateness against this generation. But what's in the past, I don't care. 
Do do you have nightmares? No. <laughs> I don't have nightmares because I have these bodyguards around me in the right. And for what nightmare? To be scared to die? Young I will never die. You guarantee? That's it. And if I die tomorrow, I have money. Alexandra promised me a million times. You will be invited. Music, drinking, eating, singing. The invitation card I wrote too. You have to write down. Happy invitation. My father passed away. You are invited for singing, drinking, music, for a happy funeral. If you are sad, you can stay at home. If you want to sing and to drink with some music, you are invited. I wrote it down, and I have money. Did Why you have to be sad? American citizen. I never dreamed to be American. Today I carry the flag. You know, in the whole world, everybody looks up to America. You think I know in my life what America is? I heard America. And from childhood, I remember I want America, America, what America? Why I never deemed Anglia or Russia or Belgium or Switzerland? America, the whole world looks up to America. And Did you ever have a time in your life where you found it difficult to cope with the legacy of the Holocaust, psychologically or personally? No, no, not only no. I say it many times, it was worked to have the six million dead people to be killed, that if they wouldn't be killed, the Jewish state would never exist. You follow me? Let me explain to you another language. If 1948, when became the state of Israel, and Ben Gurion stretched out the hand for the Muslim world. Let's live, if not in love, let's live in business-like way. Israel would never exist. I bless them every day that they are hated me. I don't hate Muslim. I love them. Because they are hateness, Israel would never be existed. Without the hateness of the Mus Arafat, state of Israel would never exist. Only this hateness brought us to the power that today we are in the 10 world power atomic strength. Do you, have you ever felt or do you feel angry? If I ever felt? Angry. About what happened? About? about what happened during the Holocaust? Do you feel anger? Anger? No, I don't feel anger. Again, I like to be hated because this hated let us build the Jewish state. With love, we will be destroyed. We won the wars only because we fight the wars with love, not in hateness. I was in Arab many years. For example, we were marching from Aza to the Suez Canal. Thousands of Egypt soldiers were going with old shirts, with old shoes beside us. Never, ever, and believe me, I not want to show up, never, ever I heard or I saw that a Jewish soldier said, let's kill one of them. Never. But they announced it 24 hours a day. We will kill you all. We will erase you from the ground. Never. I never ever heard that one of the soldiers want to rape an Arab woman. We went to villages. Never, you know. Never. We are human beings. Everything can happen. But I grew up there. We marched with them. We went to Gaza, Rafia, Khan Yunus went through our villages, girls were asking for help. Never, nobody's mind would come in through to rape a Muslim woman, any woman, Muslim or Christian. But they said day and night, not what I say, it's documented. We will erase you from this world. 
And when they said they want to erase Israel, I was happy. I said, be my guest. But they added up something else. They want to erase Israel and the whole Jewish people in the whole world. I said this, I don't take it. You want to erase Israel? Be my guest. Try it. But the whole Jewish people, the whole world, this I don't erase. And we survive. Until now, I don't like to be helpless and hopeless. When you are helpless, it's end of the world. When you are hopeless, it's end of the world. And from look what is going on. 500,000 people got killed in Syria, Muslim. They never mentioned Israel. We help the people who run in the hospitals, we help them. We don't have hateness to the Muslim world. I have Muslim like brother. I live together, we work together. They hated me, be my guest. But we don't hate nobody. How do you feel about the perpetrators? About? The perpetrators, the Nazis. About the Nazis? I, they don't exist for me. I look at the German new generation, what they are today. I look what the councillor said. I look they open the borders. I look they sent to Israel billions of dollars. I look the announcement of Angela Merkel who said, we will never ever let Israel to fall go to München, go to Dachau, I went with my children, beautiful Jewish community. The German government invite Jewish people to come back, settle down, beautiful kindergarten, beautiful school. What I have the business with the German, what they prove. For example, what the hateness of the Arabs who made war with us 70 years, what they improved? What did they prove? Did they improve something? If they take a, CPA, what they gained from their hateness. If they gained, okay, they lost. And once a diplomat asks, you don't, you have to wake up. You lost one war, two wars, three wars, four wars. You lose only the war. You are not taking a new step to my, try peace with them. You know what the Arab diplomat said? It's not important how many wars we lose. We have to win only one. You understand what he said? If we will won, if we won one, never the Jewish people will exist. It's not important. They don't care if they die 10,000, 100,000. Look in Syria what is going. 500,000 Muslim children. And you believe me is good, you don't believe me is good. I cry for the Muslim children like I cry for a Jewish. A child is a child. Child want to go to school, kindergarten. Child want the daddy. 500, God, 500,000. Did you see demonstration from the Muslim community on their shares? And they kill each other. That's why they, they will not kill the Jewish people. How can you make peace with them? They don't want, very simple. And every Jewish people dreams to live in peace with the Palestinian government. But you have a Palestinian government in Ramallah, you have a Palestinian government in Gaza. We gave back Gaza beautiful homes. We evicted 10,000 people from Gaza. Not one settlement in Gaza. And you know what they, we got a present for them? You don't remember? They sent 4,600 missiles. Can you imagine if we cannot stop the missiles? How we would look? Why did you go to the trial of Reinhold Hanning? Why? Why did you go to the trial? Why In I go to the trial? Trial. Why? Because I want to meet this guy who see this picture there. And I was thinking for my talking to him that I don't have hateness against you because he admitted. And I was thinking you will bring in an other SS officer who will see the dead marsh existed. And who will see I was in the dead marsh where Joshua said he was there. Did you speak to Hanning? Did you speak to him, to the Nazi? To the, the Nazi was sitting only with two lawyers. I had 30 lawyers. 
and nine judges and 250 in the court behind me. They all celebrated me. For my speech, I said I don't, zero haters against the Nazis. I don't exist. I don't want to know about them. I know of this generation in Germany, they, they welcome the Jewish people. The help of the state of Israel. I don't look hateless, I look love. Did you speak to him directly? To him? I couldn't, they didn't let me to go there. I wanted to go, he's in a wheelchair. He's my age, but they didn't let me to go. Um, you took your children to visit Dachau. Why did you do that? I want to see them where I was, where I came from. You know, it's a different story to take them to the mixing machine, to the cement building what I build. It's different. Where I told people in the mixing machine with these two hands, and to explain them the place. And the counselor was there, you know. It's not something, uh, a game or a show off. Did you take them to Hungary? Yes. When? Uh, 10, 20 years ago. I showed them the place where I was born. When I, I traveled the world with them. I, Everything I did for my family, I traveled the world again. I teach them horse riding, ice skating, whatever sport they want, I teach them. Only TV I didn't have. They have I bought a TV when they were 12 or 13 years. And I had one bedroom, you see this one? This I raised the four children. And I have only one bed, they were sleeping on one bed. Did you go to Auschwitz with them? No. Why? Uh, they wanted to take me with the dead march. I didn't want to go with them. March of the living? I didn't want to go to the march of the living. Because I didn't want to show a hero to go there, 10,000 people there, and they had enough people there that they can explain the things for. I, it's, I had a feeling I like to talk only to my generation, 13, 14 years, because I tell them all the time, you are my mirror. When I'm talking to you, I talk to myself. Do you want to go to Auschwitz with your children to visit Birkenau? If they let out Pollard from the jail, I will go with my children the next march of the living, I told them. Why would you make those two things connected? Because for me, he's a soldier. And he was in the jail for 30 years for due hateness, not from the guilt. He didn't know, he didn't, he didn't do the right thing because he was a spy. But he didn't deserve 30 years jail. Nobody got killed from his spying. Why have you avoided going to Auschwitz? Hmm? Why have you avoided going to Birkenau? I don't avoid nothing, but I feel myself more dedicated to schools, to my age children, to my age, 15 years, 14 years, 16 years, to teach them that they don't have to go through again what I went through, and they listen to me. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more time. You can ask any time. Yeah. What is it that's prevented you from going to Auschwitz until now? Nothing prevents me, nothing. But I sent all my children, they were there. Judica was there, Markele was there, Rachel was there, Alexandra was there. They went already to the March of the Living. They represented their father. Yes, I didn't go with them. Again, I come back, I tell you again and again and again. Young children, they come, they hug me, they kiss me, and they agree with my speech. Because I talk to the point. I don't talk what happened 3,500 years ago with the Beit Amigdash, with the Kohanim. I don't talk bullshit. I talk realistic thing. And Rachel came back only last week. It, she took a group to Israel, 15 students, 
and she was a leader to Israel. For me, she wasn't a leader, she was a soldier. And I told Rachel, wherever you step, every inch, she went to Sodom, she went to Meitz of Eilat, remember and tell them, your father, I was working the highway to Eilat, highway to Sodom, every inch, where Ben Gurion lives in Keren Kayemet, every inch where you step, and for me, she was a commander like Arya Sharon, a general. You know what is to see your daughter? To take 15 American children who were never visiting Israel, and Rachel is the leader, and the parents who came to say goodbye for the children, and I'm the father of this soldier. For me, she's a soldier, and she's only a teacher. Can you forgive the Nazis? Nobody can forgive. Who can forgive? I told it in Germany too. I don't have hateness, but I forgive. Nobody has the right to forgive for the murderers, what they did. But this oath, which don't exist, I look what's happening, no. This is important for me. Did you understand the point? Hateness, I'm not the hateness. I fight the hateness with love. It's different. Did Jews go like lambs to the slaughter? Hmm? Did Jews go like lambs to the slaughter? Judy? Did, did Jewish people go like lambs, like animals to slaughter? In the Nazi time? Yes, all of them. I myself went like, like, you know, but the bottom line is, if you want to make everything clear, we were not raised to stand up. We were not raised for partisan. We were raised from holiness and from love. Most of the Jewish people, as we couldn't organize underground to fight the fascist or something, we, we didn't have the education. We had the education where we all reached tighter from the Satmar and Rebbe, God and God and Mashiach. Biggest bullshit. This I want to make clear for this generation. And I, yes, I, had, I had a discussion with Alexander and Rachel. They said, Joshua, you are not right. You don't want to talk of Paro, Haman. Who the hell to want to know Paro, Haman? We have Hitler, we had the, the Spanish Inquisitor, we had Auschwitz. What I have to talk them, Paro and Haman, Avadim, Hayinu, Bumitzrai. This bullshit. I have to talk the day Herzl said 110 years ago. We Jewish people have to be united and to create a Jewish home. And the ultra religious said that what Herzl want is nothing else. He wanted to make assimilation between the Jewish and the Christian. And this is not true. But any Christian want to be Jewish, be my guest. Nothing wrong. And again, to have a lot of people in America, the Protestant and the many religious, the, they are liberals, they want to come back again to the Judaism. And the old Orthodox guy said, no, you can be separated. As if can be separated, who can we be united? What is the difference for you if they want to come back to the Kotel Amaravi? You know, once a woman, once a Jewish uh, a newscaster saw an old Jewish man goes every day to the Kotel Amaravi. And after one day, she stepped up to the old man. She said, you know, old man, I see every, you every day you are coming, pray to the, to the Kotel Amaravi. Can you tell me what do you gain from this? You know what this answer was? This is like talking to the wall. The same thing what this ultra-Orthodox taught children, this generation, like talking to the wall. Haman, Paro, Beit Amigdash, all this bullshit. 
I want to talk to them only for the last hundred years and they appreciate it and they are very smart. What would be your message to future generations, your message to the future? Everybody has to get Israeli education, Jewish education. Religious is not a point. Religious is zero. Zionistic, to, I tell them, religious Zionistic tradition for the Jewish children. If they marry the uh, half Jewish, a quarter Jewish, we have to look for united. But more Jewish people we will have in the world united, more stronger we will exist. This is my message. But history you can learn from 3,000, 5,000 years. But this generation push a button and they know everything. You don't have to educate them. They will tell you the answer right away. I want to educate them my age. And how do you define your identity? Hmm? How do you define your identity? From what I went through in my life, step by step. What do you think, how I came, i give you an example, how I came to this solution, what I asked for you, please sign me this letter, sign your signature in somebody else from high level people, and give me Jesse Jackson, the rabbi, who came up and he hugged me, because I know who Obama is, I know what Obama did, with the UN, and I know that he's 100% sorry, or not sorry, I don't care, but if he will see the signature of Jesse Jackson and their brothers, he will say, I will make gesture to Israel, and I will let this guy to move to Israel. And this will be the end and the top of my entire wish in my life. If I will got a letter in the newspaper, on the TV, that Obama let him go out to Israel. What the big deal? Other countries, they throw out the spies. In America, throw out the criminal. And he served 30 years in jail, and they put him outside the jail that he must stay here when he belongs to Israel. My feeling is, if we really see, you will see in other five days. You will see, I have a feeling and a hope that he will see, let him go. For thanks for you, thanks from Jesse, and thanks for who, who else signed it? Another higher, higher, high, no? But Obama will appreciate, if you look at him, he knows who he is. You agreed to give your testimony today. Why did you agree to give your testimony to the Shoah Foundation today? It's a very big thing. Because I hear the voice of the people, what they said, Joshua, don't let us forget. And I would never, ever believe that after these years, still have people who don't want to forget the Holocaust. Not to honor me, I don't care, I can zero. But this will continue. This not only the Jewish people. This many other countries too. The Shoah represent other countries too. Not only the Jewish people. Now you will see how many articles you will see what Obama did in Syria. This will not go away quiet. This is a Holocaust. Worse than a Holocaust, because the Germans never ever killed German people. The Germans want to kill the Jewish, the homosexuals, the invalid, but German never kill German. And this will go to the history in the Shoah, that not only Jewish, look what they did in Syria. And what happened in Syria is Obama did with clearance, with the State of Secretary, Jerry, State, what is his name? Gary. John Kerry. Ken Ashmok. Thank you for agreeing to this. <laughs> Sorry. And I'm telling you, and if this will happen, as you will be my the God too, I will love you forever.
I'm telling you, I'm not joking. You will be my brother, you will be my God. If no, you are my, still my brother, I love you. But if they will say, Polas can go to Israel, I buy tickets for all my children, I will arrive with him to Israel. Joshua Kaufman, thank you very much. Don't thank me, nothing. You can, the children want to give me water, this, please. I don't need food, I don't need water. I ate only because I wanted to give you, I didn't want to, you think you, I didn't, I don't need food. From air I can exist. Only to talk to her I can exist. Only the dream, what I'm waiting from the rest of from tomorrow, from you, and the dream to hear and answer. Yes, I don't have no more wishes in my entire life. Thank you. And God bless you. I love you. I love him. I'm sorry that the girl ran away, but what can I do? And uh, you know I love you not from today. I told it many times, I love you, double love. Because for me, you are amazing too. I'm not joking, I don't give you compliment, you know, because I want to make myself a Catholic, a Christian, father Catholic, a priest, and to take care of this organization, they are part. And still, my brain is, because I go from a point, I was a commander in the army. I never command the soldier go to this minefield, to clear this minefield. When I gave the command, I teach them how to take apart a mine, because you have to know how to put together, how to take apart. And I told them, I am the first who are going on the minefield with education, what I gave you, apart 50 feet from one each other. Because in this profession, nobody could make twice a mistake. I showed them first what I'm doing, then I do the command, you do and do everything. Before we didn't clear the way, the army couldn't go ahead. But to sit in the back and to tell them, you go, you go, you go, I never did it. First I went. And when I have two more sturdy kilometers with the whole uniform, I didn't sit on a jeep and I was driving and you were walking. I was the first, I walk, you walk. Have you been in Masada? Did you run out the step? Three on, did you, with the elevator? No, with the feet. I ran it too, I did it many times. Again, I didn't go into the elevator. I was the first I was running up. For me to run up was nothing. But if I would do it with an elevator, I'm a false guy. I go to the elevator and they tell you, no, no, you go there. No, I went the first, and I said all the time. And that is my, when children are coming to me, daddy, I'm tired, I don't buy this. Daddy, I'm hungry. I don't eat, you will eat next time, next day, next week. I don't take no for an answer. I love you. Be strong, be happy, God bless you, God bless you. I salute to you. I'm sorry that I'm talking too much, but he came. Thank you, Joshua. You can send me a Who is in this photo? Hmm? Who is in this photo? This is me, this is my father, this is my stepmother, this is my wife, Margaret. This is Judica, this is Margaret. Judica, Markele, Rachele, Alexandra. Right, Rachele? Right. Right? Right. Joshua, 1947, my wife, Margaret, Hatam Bekala. 1974, do it again. Not 1947. Just do that again. Nineteen seventy-four. Seventy-four. Just say my wedding day. 
Okay, 1974, you are right. No, I said 47, I was 47 years old. 1975. 1975. I made the mistake. 18 years old. Okay, I need you to tell me who it is and the age. Age? Tell me who this is. Joshua. After, after the World War II after I came back to Hungary. I leave this picture. After I took my group of soldiers, 67 war to Kebe Rachel, Bethlehem. This in Ismailia, I went to a British cemetery and I found the one Matseva with a Magen David, a Jewish soldier who died in the British Army, Ismailia, Egypt. This is the bridge what I worked to put the pontoon together from the Israeli side to Suez Canal, the, to put it together. This I am, I manage the work. El Arish, arresting day. Joshua Kaufman. I was in the reserve army. Okay. And this is my profession, Absolutely. make a picture. Oh yeah, we'll do that after. Uh, okay. But talk about this photograph. This in, uh, in one of the Arab villages. What year was it? in the Sinai, close to the Suez Canal. Okay. Uh, talk about this, this face right here. Who is this? My grandchild, the first boy grandchild, Eitan Meir. Here is the name after my brother, Meyerke, who got cleared the first day we arrived to Auschwitz. The first, the name was given after Meyer, Eitan Meyer Bondi. Bondi is a very popular Hungarian name. The first boy grandchild. This is my profession for 25 years in Israel, most of the time for the IDF. This I did for 25 years. I'm working of all the heavy equipment, caterpillar, mechanic, and uh, operator of caterpillar, bulldozer, crane, all of them. I was five years working in Suez Canal and I crossed Suez Canal with the unit of Ariel Sharon in 1973. Okay, and tell me about this. This was a train. This was a train. We were deported. 80 people in a train like this, 40 on this side, 40 on this side, and the middle was two half border for using for toilet. Give me the soldier too, the other picture was connected. Then, but on the bottom. Okay, so tell me about that. I got it from them. Okay, so hold that on your knee. And In this photo? Here I am, one is a two-star general in the American Air Force, the other one is a three-star general, and this is a very close friend. We were celebrated, an Air Force fighter pilot, uh, David, 
I gave a speech of surviving. They asked me to tell them a speech how I survived everything. And I was celebrated with ovation. Thank you very much. What is it? Oh, tell, huh? tell us what is this? I got this uh, present for them. Okay, so start from the beginning. Tell me where you were when you got this present. I went to American Air Force. They invited me. They want to listen of my surviving. And I got an ascending ovation. And this I got a present with a sword. This was a base in one of the desert close to the Suez Canal in 1973. 73. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. And this is the picture, 1944. And this is the place, 1944, where I r arrived with my family to Auschwitz, Saturday morning, 6 o'clock. And from 100 people from my family, we survived five people. I'm one of them. And this picture is from 1944, when we arrived. And the main thing in this picture, the three airplane, what you see flying, F-15 was flying over Auschwitz, one of the uh, remembrance of the, of the march of the leaving to Auschwitz. And the middle plane is the commander of the Israeli Air Force. And this is my picture, my bank account. Judika Kaufman served in the Israeli Air Force for two and a half years. She was teaching from Hebrew to English or from English to Hebrew. And this is my daughter, Markele, who decorated the palace of uh, King Saudi Arabia. Special airplane came to pick her up from Paris. And this is Rachele Kaufman, who served Nefesh Benefesh for seven years in Yerushalayim. And this is Alexandra, my baby child. And this is my bank account statement. And I feel myself Rockefeller. And I think Rockefeller is poor compared to me. Thank you.